Councillor Prince Bay. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor, sorry, you're Councillor Paquette, right? Yeah, Councillor yes. Paquette. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah. Councillor Tang. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. And Councillor Jans. Good morning. All right, I'm going to go over to City Clerk for uh, some. Uh, words that she has to remind us about. So, uh, so over Thank you, to Mayor Clerk. Sohi. Yeah. And so just before council begins its meeting, I just would like to go over the emergency response and evacuation process for this room. In the event of an emergency, everybody who's in the room must vacate through the nearest safe exit. Those seated in the gallery behind us should take direction from security who are over to our left to evacuate. And council, you'll take direction from myself and we'll get you out of the room as safely and quickly as possible. After evacuating the room, please proceed to the stairwells and take the stairs to the ground level and evacuate the building through the doors marked emergency exit and go to a mustard point. Uh, please do not take the elevator or walk through the city room, which is in City Hall. Anybody with limited mobility, um, please identify yourselves to either myself or my two monitors seated on either side of me, and we will assist those with limited mobility in vacating council chambers. Finally, if you have any questions, please speak to this, either myself or the security guard if you require first aid at any point throughout the meeting. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Thank you so much for uh, the reminder. And at this time, I will uh, ask Councillor Hamilton to uh, move the adoption of the agenda. Yes, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, I will move that the December 12th, 13th, 2023 City Council meeting agenda be adopted with the following changes. The addition of item 7.13, 2024 Council and Committee calendar change and item 9.3, collective bargaining update, which is an in-private item pursuant to sections 24 and 25 of the Freedom of Information Protection of Privacy Act, as well as a replacement re report on item 10, motions pending, 10.2, infrastructure enhancement for transit facilities, and 10.3, 124th Street Business Association one-time funding. Second. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson's a yes. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. I'm a yes, too. And Mayor Sohi. In favor. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Vote is carried. Uh, Councillor Knack, approval of the minutes, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor Sohi. I'll move the approval of the minutes from the fall two meetings, the November 6th, 2023 uh, City Council public hearing. November 7th, 2023 City Council meeting, the November 10th, 2023 City Council non-regular meeting, the November 20th, 2023 City Council public hearing, and the November 21st, 22nd, 27th, and 28th City Council meeting. Okay. Need a seconder? Second. Councillor Rutherford, please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Protocol items. We have few protocol items. Good morning. Eight years ago, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission released its final report. Which, highlight, which highlights the traumatic history and stories stemming from the residential school system. The report also out outlines 94 calls to action. In the response, the city of Edmonton undertook a number of actions to set us on our path to reconciliation. We developed the Indigenous Framework, which was co-created with Indigenous elders, knowledge keepers, community partners, youth, and the broader indigenous community. The framework states our city's seven commitments, as well as the roles that we strive to embody, being listeners, connectors, advocates, and partners. We also often seek the knowledge and expertise of indigenous relations office. That team works hard to develop, promote, and support indigenous relations in Edmonton and engage our workforce along the way. Through our collaboration, 
we have undertaken many initiatives that work to strengthen our relationships with indigenous peoples. One way we, one way we achieve this is by creating projects that educate Edmontonians about the depth and culture of First, of first Peoples, including the Residential School Monument at the Legislature, Grandin LRT Station renaming, and a ceremonial pit fire, fire pit at City Hall. This year, we also celebrate the grand opening of the Kiki Jayaski, Canada's first permanent urban indigenous culture, cultural and ceremonial grounds. We have, shared, we have a shared responsibility to be stewards of this land, and this space helps facilitate that. Currently, one in 15 indigenous peoples in urban centers experience houselessness, compared to one in 128 of the general population. That is why we created Indigenous Affordable Housing Strategy. We are prioritizing building more indigenous-led supportive housing, where tenants have access to compassionate and cultural help. So as we recognize the anniversary of the TRC final report, we acknowledge our efforts while reaffirming our ongoing commitment to reconciliation. We know we have more work to do to address the 94 calls to action and will continue to do so. Because when more people are safe, healthy, and able to maintain a good standard of living, everyone in Edmonton benefits. So thank you. The second protocol, it is with deep sadness that I share the news of passing of the former city elderman, Patricia McKenzie, on November 30th. Pat was born in Regina, where she received her bachelor in education from the University of Saskatchewan. She married love, she married love of her life, Barry, who was very supportive of her in her endeavors. Together, they lived and worked in both Quebec and Ontario. She came to Edmonton in 1985, where just one year later, Pat was first elected and served three terms in Ward 5 as an elder, elder, man, elder man, the term we previously used for councillor. That year, the Edmonton municipal election saw five women elected for the first time ever, including future mayor Jan Reimer. <clears throat> Pat was an active volunteer in the community, serving on many boards, including Habitat for Humanity, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, where she served as president in 1994. In 2020, Pat was an active member of the steering committee of the YWCA Project Steering for Azina, which highlights the history of women in Edmonton municipal politics. YWCA CEO Catherine O'Neill and her mother-in-law, Mary O'Neill, are also joining us, and Mary was a dear friend of Pat. Her legacy surrounds us in this building as she was also trusted to help architect Jean Dub choose finishes of the new city hall. Today, we welcome her son, Matt, and two grandchildren, Bryn and Eli, who have joined us for this special recognition. We also have Pat's daughters, Tara and Camilla, joining us virtually. On behalf of city council, and the people of Edmonton, I would like to extend my condolences to all of Pat's family, friends, and loved ones. She was an incredible woman, and her legacy lives on in City Hall, as you can see here, having majority women leading this city. First, I would like to invite Patricia's grandchildren to share a few words about their grandma. Mr. Brent and Eli, please come over. You told me some cool stories about uh, your grandma. Pretty sure you're going to enjoy sharing those. Um, our grandma was very interested in spoiling us. She as most grandmothers are. She was a 
always giving us presents and always making sure that we were happy no matter what we were doing. And she was a very important part of our life. We saw her every week. Um, she loved to play card games and board games with us, and she also liked to make us hot chocolate and banana bread. Um, and she always kept a smile on her face, even if she was mad. <laughs> I know that there are, there are a lot of people who um, have a memory of a very kind woman who they might not have known was named Patricia McKenzie, but that she helped them very much. She was, a lot, she was a very nice woman, and she helped a lot of people. Um, she also had a lot of friends, and she tried to be with her family as much as she could, and she tried to be with her friends as much as she could. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us and uh, sharing your, your memories with your grandmother. All right. Yeah, I, so I guess I would just add a couple of things. Thank you, Mayor Soki. Yeah. Um, uh, I uh, had the privilege of becoming a, uh, a developing a great friendship with uh, Pat. Uh, it wasn't long after I uh, announced my candidacy in 2017 that I got to meet Pat. Uh, her and Barry lived not too far from where I lived and uh, we had a lot of great conversations. Uh, I, Pat was a great supporter uh, and, and she was always uh, trying to help me along through my council work and, and through the um, various council matters of the day. Uh, maybe just read a bit more of what I had prepared here. Uh, Patricia was born in Regina in 1940, as was mentioned, and attended Balfour Tech High School, where her future father-in-law was the principal. Uh, Pat received her Bachelor of Education from the University of Saskatchewan in 1962. Upon graduation, she married Barry, and they moved to Montreal, where she taught history and home economics. And the couple moved to several locations in Ontario, including Toronto and Prescott, where Pat served on town council from 1974 to 1980. And it was during these Ontario years that Pat and Barry welcomed their two daughters and their son. And as has been mentioned, after moving to Alberta in 1985, uh, Pat became a member of Edmonton City Council and served three terms starting in 1986. Uh, Pat was always quick to credit her staff, Gay Young and, and Allison Edwards, for enabling her to serve her constituents so well. In those days, there were two councillors per ward, and Pat served uh, with Lillian Strozik during Pat's three terms. And this was the first time that two, two women represented a ward. Uh, Jan, pardon me, um, Pat served with Mayors Lawrence DeCore, Terry Cavanaugh, and Jan Reimer, and, the, and again, as has been mentioned, that council that was led by Mayor Reimer was the first in Edmonton City Council's history with an equal number of men and women. Uh, during Pat's time on council, the council considered some of the most significant issues that the city has faced. Pat served on a task force which recommended selling Edmonton Telephones Company to Alberta Government Telephones, now TELUS, in 1995. And it was during this time that the first conversation started to close uh, the city centre airport. And during her time on council, Pat served on the boards of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and the Alberta and Urban Municipalities Association where she also served as president. Pat led a delegation from the Canadian International Development Agency to the Czech Republic in 95 to advise on local government. 
and her dedication to community went well beyond her time on council. In her early years, she was active with the Rotary and the University Women's Club. She served as, served as chair of the Alberta Commission on Learning and as board member for the Alberta Blue Cross, Roots of Empathy, Tree Canada, where she was also chair, the Centre for Family Literacy, the Law Enforcement Review Board, the Alberta Secretariat for Homelessness, the Municipal Government Board, Homeward Trust, where again she was chair, Habitat for Humanity, the Alzheimer's Society and the University Senate, University of Alberta Senate. Pat received many awards and accolades over the years for her public work, including being recognized as one of Alberta's most influential people and a trailblazer by the YWCA. Pat was awarded the Alberta School Board Association President's Award, the Alberta Centennial Medal for Education, and the Alberta Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal. Over the last several years, Pat hosted a lot more of those backyard coffee parties. She would uh, invite a lot of her friends over and then pepper me with questions and just kind of let me uh, see if I could stand on my own two feet or not. <laughs> and uh, we spent a lot of time uh, having a lot of conversations about the current work of council. Uh, and I really came to appreciate those, those little coffee meetings that we would have. She would ask me really pointed questions and uh, it was a real litmus test because if I could even if we didn't agree, if I could make myself understood by Pat, then I knew I was on the right track. And if I couldn't, then I knew I had some homework to do. Uh, we did actually just have a cup of coffee just a couple of weeks ago, and she was still serving, or I think her time was coming up at the end, uh, the end of her time was coming on the uh, Habitat for Humanity Board, but she was still on the Alberta Senate. And she had said to me that she was looking for other boards and committees that she might join. Uh, she had a lot of time on her hands, she said, with uh, Barry in long-term care, and her house was just a little too quiet on just a few too many evenings. So to hear of her passing really just a few days later was, was quite a shock. I'll just offer a few more words here from Pat's published obituary. Uh, for those of us who knew her, we will remember her love of entertaining, her spectacular garden, and the sure joy she took in being with family and friends. Pat made an impact on everyone she met, and we will miss her desperately. Patricia's life was a life well lived. She always gave more than she took and she left this world a better place. I know I speak for many here that we are feeling a significant loss of our friend and for me, a mentor and advisor that I truly cherished. Patricia is survived by her devoted husband of 60 years, Barry, daughters Camilla, Tara and son Matthew and their families, sister Maxine Woodward and sister-in-law Isla McKenzie. On November 30th, Patric Patricia Elizabeth McKenzie, beloved wife, mother, friend, mentor, and community leader passed peacefully in her home from this life to the next. May she rest in peace. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel, for sharing those uh, you know, personal stories and personal connections to, uh, to Patricia and the family. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, uh, our thoughts are with you all. Thank you. All right, now we go to select items for debate. Councillor uh, Hamilton? Okay, um, I'm gonna grab the must be selected at the at the same time I grab the item I prefer. Um, okay. Item 6.1, must be selected. Uh, item 7.3. Yep. Uh, uh, I'm inclined to grab 7.4 because I think that's of general interest to council. Um, item 7.7 7, uh, must be selected. Um, and uh, I would like to grab item 7.10. And then item seven. seven surplus school site? Uh, yeah, the surplus school site. That's for voting purposes. Yep. And then item, uh, uh, and to speak, uh, actually, no, just voting purposes. Uh, and uh, item 7.12 must be selected. And uh, I will also grab item 9.1, which must be selected. 
uh, item 9.2, it must be selected, and item 9.3, it must be selected. And that's all for me. Councillor Rutherford? Oh. You okay? Okay. All right. I, anyone else? Any other selections? Uh, Councillor Stevenson? Thank you. I'll select 7 1 and 7 2. 7 1, 7 2. So that is seven one seven two seven three seven four seven 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 ten seven one two then nine one nine two nine three. Okay, can someone move the balance, please? So moved. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Please, oh, so I need a seconder, Second. Councillor Stevenson. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So I'll go to clerk. Please uh, tell us what we have already approved. Thank you, thank you, Mayor Sohi. So City Council has approved a revised due date for item 5.1, direct downtown to airport bus route is now coming back to the January 30th City Council meeting. Council's also approved the recommendations in item 7.5, Revised Council Policy and Procedure Agency Boards and Commissions and Committees Governance Review Implementation. 7.6 Enterprise Risk Management, the Policy C587 Update. As well as 7.8, the Edmonton Business Improvement Area's 2024 Budget, as well as the BIA's 2024 Board of Directors Appointments. As well as 711, the affordable housing agreement with the Catholic Social Services, and 713, the 2024 Council and uh, Committee calendar change. Thank you so much. Uh, request to speak none. Request for specific time on the agenda. There are some changes there. Councillor Hamilton, do you want to move that? Yes, um, I'll move that the following be dealt with at a specific time on the agenda. Item 9.1, collective bargaining update, uh, verbal report, second item at 345 on Tuesday, December 12th. And item 9.3, collective bargaining update, first item at 345 on Tuesday, December 12th. Second. Second, Councillor Rice, please vote. Sorry, Councillor Stevenson is a yes. Thanks, <coughs> Councillor Stevenson. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Vote on bylaws not select for debate. Councillor Cardmill. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, I had a request to separate one out separately, so I'll do that first. Okay. So uh, I will move second reading of item 8.2. Second. Okay. Uh, please vote. Councillor Stevenson is a yes. Thanks, Councillor Stevenson. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is uh, carried. Mayor so he'll move third reading of item 8.2, bylaw 20639. Okay. Second. Okay, please vote.
We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move first reading of items 8.1, 8.3, 8.4, 8.5, 8.6, 8.7, 8.8, 8.9, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 8.26, 8.27, 8.28, 8.29, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.46, 8.47, 8.48, 8.49, 8.50, 8.51, 8.52, 8.53, 8.54, 8.55, 8.56, 8.57, 8.58, 8.59, 8.60, 8.61, 8.62, 8.63, 8.64, 8.65, 8.66, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76, 8.77, 8.78, 8.79, 8.80, 8.81, 8.82, 8.83, 8.84, 8.85, 8.86, 8.87, 8.88, 8.89, 8.90, 8.91, 8.92, 8.93, 8.94, 8.95, 8.96, 8.97, 8.98, 8.99, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 8.26, 8.27, 8.28, 8.29, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.46, 8.47, 8.48, 8.49, 8.50, 8.51, 8.52, 8.53, 8.54, 8.55, 8.56, 8.57, 8.58, 8.59, 8.60, 8.61, 8.62, 8.63, 8.64, 8.65, 8.66, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76, 8.77, 8.78, 8.79, 8.80, 8.81, 8.82, 8.83, 8.84, 8.85, 8.86, 8.87, 8.88, 8.89, 8.90, 8.91, 8.92, 8.93, 8.94, 8.95, 8.96, 8.97, 8.98, 8.99, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 8.26, 8.27, 8.28, 8.29, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.46, 8.47, 8.48, 8.49, 8.50, 8.51, 8.52, 8.53, 8.54, 8.55, 8.56, 8.57, 8.58, 8.59, 8.60, 8.61, 8.62, 8.63, 8.64, 8.65, 8.66, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76, 8.77, 8.78, 8.79, 8.80, 8.81, 8.82, 8.83, 8.84, 8.85, 8.86, 8.87, 8.88, 8.89, 8.90, 8.91, 8.92, 8.93, 8.94, 8.95, 8.96, 8.97, 8.98, 8.99, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 8.26, 8.27, 8.28, 8.29, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.46, 8.47, 8.48, 8.49, 8.50, 8.51, 8.52, 8.53, 8.54, 8.55, 8.56, 8.57, 8.58, 8.59, 8.60, 8.61, 8.62, 8.63, 8.64, 8.65, 8.66, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76, 8.77, 8.78, 8.79, 8.80, 8.81, 8.82, 8.83, 8.84, 8.85, 8.86, 8.87, 8.88, 8.89, 8.90, 8.91, 8.92, 8.93, 8.94, 8.95, 8.96, 8.97, 8.98, 8.99, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 8.26, 8.27, 8.28, 8.29, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.46, 8.47, 8.48, 8.49, 8.50, 8.51, 8.52, 8.53, 8.54, 8.55, 8.56, 8.57, 8.58, 8.59, 8.60, 8.61, 8.62, 8.63, 8.64, 8.65, 8.66, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76, 8.77, 8.78, 8.79, 8.80, 8.81, 8.82, 8.83, 8.84, 8.85, 8.86, 8.87, 8.88, 8.89, 8.90, 8.91, 8.92, 8.93, 8.94, 8.95, 8.96, 8.97, 8.98, 8.99, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 8.26, 8.27, 8.28, 8.29, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.46, 8.47, 8.48, 8.49, 8.50, 8.51, 8.52, 8.53, 8.54, 8.55, 8.56, 8.57, 8.58, 8.59, 8.60, 8.61, 8.62, 8.63, 8.64, 8.65, 8.66, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76, 8.77, 8.78, 8.79, 8.80, 8.81, 8.82, 8.83, 8.84, 8.85, 8.86, 8.87, 8.88, 8.89, 8.90, 8.91, 8.92, 8.93, 8.94, 8.95, 8.96, 8.97, 8.98, 8.99, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 8.26, 8.27, 8.28, 8.29, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.46, 8.47, 8.48, 8.49, 8.50, 8.51, 8.52, 8.53, 8.54, 8.55, 8.56, 8.57, 8.58, 8.59, 8.60, 8.61, 8.62, 8.63, 8.64, 8.65, 8.66, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76, 8.77, 8.78, 8.79, 8.80, 8.81, 8.82, 8.83, 8.84, 8.85, 8.86, 8.87, 8.88, 8.89, 8.90, 8.91, 8.92, 8.93, 8.94, 8.95, 8.96, 8.97, 8.98, 8.99, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 8.26, 8.27, 8.28, 8.29, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.46, 8.47, 8.48, 8.49, 8.50, 8.51, 8.52, 8.53, 8.54, 8.55, 8.56, 8.57, 8.58, 8.59, 8.60, 8.61, 8.62, 8.63, 8.64, 8.65, 8.66, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76, 8.77, 8.78, 8.79, 8.80, 8.81, 8.82, 8.83, 8.84, 8.85, 8.86, 8.87, 8.88, 8.89, 8.90, 8.91, 8.92, 8.93, 8.94, 8.95, 8.96, 8.97, 8.98, 8.99, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 8.26, 8.27, 8.28, 8.29, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.46, 8.47, 8.48, 8.49, 8.50, 8.51, 8.52, 8.53, 8.54, 8.55, 8.56, 8.57, 8.58, 8.59, 8.60, 8.61, 8.62, 8.63, 8.64, 8.65, 8.66, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76, 8.77, 8.78, 8.79, 8.80, 8.81, 8.82, 8.83, 8.84, 8.85, 8.86, 8.87, 8.88, 8.89, 8.90, 8.91, 8.92, 8.93, 8.94, 8.95, 8.96, 8.97, 8.98, 8.99, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 8.26, 8.27, 8.28, 8.29, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.46, 8.47, 8.48, 8.49, 8.50, 8.51, 8.52, 8.53, 8.54, 8.55, 8.56, 8.57, 8.58, 8.59, 8.60, 8.61, 8.62, 8.63, 8.64, 8.65, 8.66, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76, 8.77, 8.78, 8.79, 8.80, 8.81, 8.82, 8.83, 8.84, 8.85, 8.86, 8.87, 8.88, 8.89, 8.90, 8.91, 8.92, 8.93, 8.94, 8.95, 8.96, 8.97, 8.98, 8.99, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 8.26, 8.27, 8.28, 8.29, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.46, 8.47, 8.48, 8.49, 8.50, 8.51, 8.52, 8.53, 8.54, 8.55, 8.56, 8.57, 8.58, 8.59, 8.60, 8.61, 8.62, 8.63, 8.64, 8.65, 8.66, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76, 8.77, 8.78, 8.79, 8.80, 8.81, 8.82, 8.83, 8.84, 8.85, 8.86, 8.87, 8.88, 8.89, 8.90, 8.91, 8.92, 8.93, 8.94, 8.95, 8.96, 8.97, 8.98, 8.99, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 8.26, 8.27, 8.28, 8.29, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.46, 8.47, 8.48, 8.49, 8.50, 8.51, 8.52, 8.53, 8.54, 8.55, 8.56, 8.57, 8.58, 8.59, 8.60, 8.61, 8.62, 8.63, 8.64, 8.65, 8.66, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76, 8.77, 8.78, 8.79, 8.80, 8.81, 8.82, 8.83, 8.84, 8.85, 8.86, 8.87, 8.88, 8.89, 8.90, 8.91, 8.92, 8.93, 8.94, 8.95, 8.96, 8.97, 8.98, 8.99, 8.10, 8.11, 8.12, 8.13, 8.14, 8.15, 8.16, 8.17, 8.18, 8.19, 8.20, 8.21, 8.22, 8.23, 8.24, 8.25, 8.26, 8.27, 8.28, 8.29, 8.30, 8.31, 8.32, 8.33, 8.34, 8.35, 8.36, 8.37, 8.38, 8.39, 8.40, 8.41, 8.42, 8.43, 8.44, 8.45, 8.46, 8.67, 8.68, 8.69, 8.70, 8.71, 8.72, 8.73, 8.74, 8.75, 8.76,
Thank you. And good luck. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay. So you're on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, our first item, six point one. Uh, was postponed from um, October 24th, 25th city council meeting, executive, was executive committee remote, report, but needs to be dealt in camera, Thank right? You, Mr. Mayor, I can move that we go into private subject to section 24 and 25 of the Freedom of Information and Privacy, Protection of Privacy Act. Okay, Second. Second. Okay, Councilor Paquet, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried.
Are we back in public? We are in public. All right, Councillor Rutherford, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd like to move that attachment three be added to the October 13th, 2023 Integrated Infrastructure Services Report, IIS 01767, and that the actions included in attachment three be approved. And number two, that the asset rationalization framework as outlined in revised attachment one of the October 13th, 2023 Integrated Infrastructure Services Report, IIS 01767 be approved and be applied to City of Edmonton infrastructure assets as part of an asset management practice. And three, that the October 13th, 2023 Integrated Infrastructure Services Report IIS 01767 remain private pursuant to sections 24, advice from officials, and 25, disclosure harmful to economic and other interests of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Thank you. The seconder? Second. Second, Councillor Wright. Okay. All right, we have motion on the floor, so please vote. You have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Uh, we are on to now 7172, which are cross-referenced capital financial update and operating financial update up to September 30th, 2023. Please go ahead. All right, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, today we are presenting the September 30th, 2023 Operating and Capital Financial Updates. Stacey Padbury, our CFO and Deputy City Manager of Financial and Corporate Services, Harm Rye, Deputy City Treasurer and Branch Manager of Financial Services, Kent Bjornstad, Director of Corporate Accounting and Reporting, and Felicia Muthiardi, our Corporate Economist, are here to present and answer questions on the update today. Administration shares these updates three times a year with Council to show the City's financial performance against the operating and capital budgets, as well as our financial projections for the rest of the year. This regular reporting is part of our commitment to being accountable and open about our finances with Council and, of course, all Edmontonians. It also gives Council a solid understanding of our financial health to support your decision making. What we present to you today are the financial results based on what has happened to the end of September 30th, 2023 and projections to the end of the year. As we highlighted during the 2023 supplementary operating budget adjustment process in November, the city is currently projecting an unfavorable variance from the operating budget of 52 million by the end of 2023. This is down from the 73.8 million projected deficit from last quarter. So I really want to acknowledge the good work thus far in, in getting this number down as much as we can. The team will explain the root causes of this variance in the presentation. As administration, we will continue to be prudent with our spending in an effort to draw down this deficit as much as possible. However, it's still large and we will add, it will add to the financial pressures of the city already facing us through 23 to 26 budget cycle. Before we get to the economic update, I want to spend a moment on some important data and insights regarding the economic and social landscape in the Edmonton area. These statistics help shed light on various aspects of the community's well-being. As reported by the Edmonton Social Planning Council in 2021, approximately 13.7% of the population in Edmonton census metropolitan area uh, was living in poverty. We are continuing to see an increase in the number of people experiencing homelessness in Edmonton. Data from Homeward Trust as of November indicated there were over 3,080 people experiencing homelessness in Edmonton. At that level, the count of persons without stable housing will have increased for its fourth consecutive year in 2023. As of October 23rd, 2023, the count stands at 3,206 individuals without stable housing 
based on data from Homeward Trust. In 2021, the median family income in the Edmonton Census met metropolitan area was $108,390. And for individuals not part of a family median income was 39,000. Incomes have not been rising as fast as consumer prices. Even though we do not have income data for 2022, it is unlikely that income growth was within range of consumer inflation, which averaged 6.3% that year. More Albertans are finding it difficult uh, or very difficult for their household to meet its financial needs in terms of transportation, housing, food, clothing, and other necessary expenses. Statistics Canada released new findings last Friday estimating that one in three households in the Edmonton area are likely to report difficulty meeting their financial needs in October. I'll now pass over to Felicia Muthiardi who will take you through the economic update. Thank you, good morning. This economic update will focus on consumer inflation and housing starts. Starting with consumer inflation, here we have annualized headline consumer inflation for the Edmonton Census Metropolitan Area, or the CMA, which is calculated based on year-over-year -year changes in Statistics Canada's Consumer Price Index. In the city's spring outlook, we were expecting consumer inflation to ease to an average of 3.7% this year, followed by an average of 2% in 2024. Felicia, can you speak close to the mic? Oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, um, okay so in, uh, so uh, I'll go back uh, a sentence. So in our spring outlook, we were expecting consumer inflation to ease to an average of 3.7% in 2023, followed by an average of 2% in 2024. Since the start of the year, consumer inflation in the Edmonton CMA has been easing, which has definitely been welcome news. For the year through September, consumer inflation was running at a year-to-date average of 3.1%. Now in recent months, inflation has been quite volatile with much stronger growth in utility prices and for rented and owned accommodation. Price growth for rented accommodation has been trending higher recently after not seeing much, high, much growth over the course of 2022 and at the start of this year. For owned accommodation, price inflation has been on the rise since the start of 2022. Now in our fall outlook, we revised down our forecast for consumer inflation this year to reflect the general easing that we observed for the year so far. For example, in October, annualized consumer inflation eased further to an annualized rate of 1.67%, and that brought the year-to-date average to 2.9%. Our forecast is now for consumer inflation to average 3% in 2023 and continue easing to average a rate of 2.3% in 2024. Now, in our view, price pressures remain a concern, and the tra trajectory of inflation over the balance of this year and into next is uncertain, although largely concentrated in the shelter component, particularly <coughs> through higher interest rates, higher building construction <laughs> prices, and specific to rented accommodation, increased competition for rental units from in-migration, driving rental rates higher. Next slide, please. So despite stronger price pressures related to owned and rented accommodation, construction intentions for new residential structures have been softer in 2023, translating to fewer housing starts over the first three quarters of 2023 compared to the same period in 2022. Higher borrowing costs experienced by both builders and home buyers are viewed as headwinds to residential construction activity. Higher input prices experienced by builders is another challenge because of the risks associated with the financial performance of new projects, especially against a backdrop of still present economic uncertainty. On this slide, we have housing starts for Edmonton broken out by dwelling type and our estimates of household formation, which represents an estimate for the number of new households on an annual basis. The 2023 forecasts on this chart come from our spring outlook. Housing starts overall, over the first three quarters of 2023, were down 22% year over year, and led by singles, which were down 39% year over year, and then followed by apartment starts, which were down 15%. Historically, starts for those two dwelling types combined have accounted for the vast majority of new housing construction in Edmonton. Now, seeing, we are seeing a softer reduction in semi-detached housing starts, as well as an increase in row housing starts. So this suggests to us that prices and higher borrowing costs are translating to prospective home buyers looking for a single family home, now turning their sights towards lower price alternatives. Single detached homes tend to be listed at the highest price across housing types, and new single detached homes also tend to list at higher prices than existing homes. As noted in the third quarter update, strong population growth over the past couple of years and a large increase in interest rates have incentivized construction of apartment units with a vast majority of units intended for rental. We also mentioned this in our fall budget presentation, that stronger than expected in-migration is expected to boost household formation and increase the demand for housing, 
but over the long term, we expect housing starts to converge on household formation. With slower residential building construction this year against the backdrop of much stronger in-migration, there have been some concerns about housing supply shortages. Based on our analysis, housing starts over the past decade have more than kept pace with estimated household formation on a cumulative basis. However, concerns about housing supply shortages may be more so a, ref a reflection of an imbalance between demand and supply by dwelling type and or selling price. In our spring outlook, our forecast for housing starts was for an overall reduction of 6.7%, with much of the pullback coming from singles. However, in our fall outlook, we've reduced our starts forecast further. The updated forecast translates to a reduction of 16.3% year over year in 2023 to more closely align with starts activity for the year so far. As for household formation, our forecast was lifted from 11,400 in 2023 in our spring outlook to 16,100 for 2023. So this comes from our, pop, our projection for population growth between 2022 and 2023 being lifted to 4.8% in our fall outlook from 3% growth in our spring outlook. In other words, we're projecting Edmonton's population to have gained 52,500 persons between July 1st, 2022 and July 1st, 2023. However, we expect to see official figures next month. I'll now turn things over to Ken Bjornstad to walk you through the capital results. Okay. Before we do that, if you please, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, want to welcome. Uh, we have some uh, students that they might have to leave soon. Uh, uh, from Carlwood Adventist Academy, grade three. And they are here with their teacher, Ms. S. Bailey. Thank you so much for joining us. And your ward counselor is Councillor Rutherford, Ward Anernik. Thank you so much for joining us. Are you enjoying yourself? Are you having fun at City Hall? Are you? Are you just for in, for the morning, or are you going to stay for the afternoon as well? Just for the morning. Okay. Well, enjoy. Okay. I'm sorry. Can't. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, I'm so, oh, you were having mock council as well. Grade three mock council. Okay, what did you talk about? Mayor, come down here, please. Come down to the podium. We talked about children under 12 being free on public transportation. Okay, what did you dis uh, what what was the decision you made? There were nine votes for and two votes opposed. Nine and two, okay. That's I I think that will well, that'll make Councillor Paquette very very happy. <laughs> And Councilor Knack as well, right? So, <laughs> yeah, so I think, uh, uh, can you give us one reason uh, in favor of uh, and one reason against? One was against was <coughs> for children not to go alone and for not, for so like they can pay for the gas and Yes, because if the children need to get home, they can go faster home. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. We really appreciate that uh, city council, sorry, uh, kids that come to city hall get to debate some of the issues that we also debate. And uh, so thank you for sharing that with all of them. Right. Okay, thank you so much. Well, we're back to the presentation. Thank you. Okay, we'll start with the capital results. The capital report presents the capital financial results against the 2023 to 2026 capital budget, provides an update on significant projects, and includes an update on debt. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the total 23 to 26 capital budget, including expenditures beyond 2026, and shows capital spent to date in the cycle compared to the previous cycle. 
9.3 billion of the total approved 23 to 26 capital budget is for expenditures in the 23 to 26 timeframe, while the remaining 1.1 billion is for the period after 2026. As of September 30th, 2023, three quarters of a year into the four year budget cycle, the city has expended approximately $900 million of its capital budget, reflecting 10.3% of the $9.3 billion planned expenditures for the 23 to 26 period, as shown in the middle bar. For comparison, at the same point of the previous four year cycle, the city had also expended approximately $900 million, reflecting 11.8% of the planned expenditures for that period, which is shown on the right bar. The charts on this slide present the budget and schedule status of the city's significant capital profiles, comparing this reporting period to the June 2023 results. The left chart is budget status and the right chart is schedule status. The results in the charts are weighted by the capital profile budget. For example, the 17.3% red in the schedule chart is primarily made up of Valley Line Southeast, since it is such a large dollar value budget in comparison to many of the other significant capital profiles. As indicated in the charts, 99.6% of the significant capital projects are reporting within an acceptable tolerance for budget, as seen on the left, and 82.3% are projecting within an acceptable tolerance for schedule, seen on the right. Projects within, within the green or yellow status are considered to be within an acceptable tolerance. Red, yellow, and green project statuses are further explained in attachment two of the capital report. The red status for schedule is primarily made up of Valley Line Southeast, Downtown District Energy Initiative, 103 AF Pedway, Ironworks Building, building Rehab, and, and the Enterprise Trans System Transformation Program. Generally speaking, the budget and schedule status is similar to the June reporting. Moving on to debt, this chart reflects the city's tax supported debt servicing forecasted out to 2041 compared to the tax supported debt servicing limit outlined in the city's debt management fiscal policy. The city's policy limits tax supported debt servicing to 18% of the tax supported net operating expenditures which is shown as the blue diamonds line. Up to this limit, tax supported debt is considered unconstrained and can be used to fully fund capital projects. Tax supported debt servicing is reflected as the blue circles line and shaded area on the chart. The current approved tax supported debt servicing is forecasting the city to exceed the 18% limit in 2028. This means that right now we cannot finance any new capital project with 100% tax supported debt. Debt financing would be limited to those projects where the city match funding is required to leverage external funds where the external month amounts fund at minimum one third of the total project costs or where the debt is self-supporting tax guaranteed or self-liquidating. Next slide. This is the same chart, but now layering on the debt servicing limits for the city's total debt servicing. Total debt servicing includes tax supported debt, other self-supported tax guaranteed debt and self-liquidating debt. The city's total debt servicing limit is set at 21% of city revenues. And this is represented by the red squares line on the chart. Tax supported debt servicing can exceed the 18% limit up to this 21% limit, but it is constrained and can only be used to provide city match funding required to leverage external funds where the external amounts fund at minimum one third of the total project costs or where the debt supporting debt is self supporting tax guaranteed or self liquidating. Total debt servicing for the city is shown as the red triangle line on this chart and is forecasted to stay under the 21% total debt servicing limit. Next slide please. The last debt servicing limit added to the chart is the maximum total debt servicing the city can have, and it is set at 26% of total corporate revenues. For and beyond the 21% limit, up to this 26% limit is considered restricted to where the debt is required for emergency purposes. Next slide, please. Now on to operating. The operating financial report reflects the September 30th, 2023 year-to-date operating results and year-end projected projections compared to the approved budgets. We'll go through enterprise and utility results and then cover tax supported results before providing an overview of balances in our key reserves. Waste services has a net $22.1 million favorable year to date variance and a projected 9 million favorable year end variance, mainly due to lower personnel costs due to project timing, hiring restraint and position reduction, release of a one time grant related to negotiated contract amendments, higher interest revenues due to higher cash balances and interest rates, lower costs due to savings and collection services in the communal collection project, and delays in the costs of service study and environmental compliance study to 2024. This is partially offset by higher costs for the Clover Bar landfill post-closure liability due to inflation as well as supplier unavailability resulting in higher quotes than originally planned. Additionally, the work on the landfill of slurry wall to protect the North Saskatchewan River from seepage is also proving to be more challenging than anticipated. Land enterprise and Blatch River development variances are primarily, primarily related to differences in timing of land sales compared to when they were budgeted within the four year cycle. 
and Blackford Renewable Energy Utility and all three CRLs have no significant variances to report. Moving on to tax supported operations. September's year to date results for the tax supported operations is 1.4 million unfavorable or 0.1% compared to budget. And the year end projected position for tax supported operations is $52 million unfavorable or 1.8% compared to budget. The project, projected deficit has decreased by 21.8 million from the 73.8 million deficit projected in June, the June financial results. This is due to a variety of updated projections across all areas with the largest change seen in higher savings projected in salaries due to unfilled vacancies. The main factors contributing to the unfavorable variances include higher than budgeted salary settlements, lower transit fare revenue due to lower than anticipated fares in high earning product categories. While ridership numbers have reached pre-pandemic levels, a higher proportion of those riders are in discounted fare products like ride transit and seniors discounts. Lower than budgeted gas franchise fees as a result of lower distribution rates charged by ACO to customers. The city collects gas franchise fees based on delivery tariff revenues resulting from distribution charges. Furthermore, January to March 2023 was warmer than forecasted resulting in lower actual delivery tariff and franchise fee revenue for those three months compared to the assumptions used in the budget. Higher costs for additional safety measures and enhanced cleaning at transit stations and transit centers. Lower than budgeted permit fees, mainly due to lower than expected on-street construction and maintenance revenue, as well as lower traffic control fees, such as pods, developer signs, moving permits, and detours. These unfavorable variances are partially offset by favorable personnel budget variances, mainly due to unfilled vacancies across city departments, some of which would be a result of the OP12 restraints that were implemented. Higher memberships and admissions revenue due to recreation and attraction facilities achieving higher than expected demand for programs and services. And lower than budgeted tax supported costs for LRT operations due to the delayed Valley Line Southeast. As of the end of September, the city had incurred approximately 16.1 million in costs to support Albertans impacted as a result of the wildfires in 2023 related to the Drayton Valley and Edson wildfires, as well as the Yellowknife wildfires. These costs include establishment of an evacuee reception center and fire support services provided to impacted communities. The year end projected results include a full recovery of these costs from the impacted communities through mutual aid agreements. These communities will ultimately seek reimbursement for the eligible costs through the provincial disaster recovery program. Next slide, please. As per the financial stabilization reserve policy, at year end, any tax supported surplus is transferred to the reserve and any deficit would be offset by the reserve, thereby reducing the reserve balance. The minimum and maximum balances are calculated as 5% and 8% of current year tax supported expenditures in accordance with this reserve policy. This slide has been updated to reflect decisions made during the fall of 2023 SOBA to release $5 million in funding previously held within the appropriated FSR back to the unappropriated FSR related to the A1 soccer center. So it'll be different than the FSR reporting in the Q3 financial update as that was released before the budget decisions were finalized. The projected balance of the FSR for 2023 based on approved budget transfers from the reserve is $145 million reflected by the solid red line on the gauge, which is above the minimum balance of 123.5 million, but below the target balance of 205.1 million. This balance does not reflect the projected year end tax border deficit of $52 million. We included the dotted red line on the gauge to show the revised FSR balance considering the impact of the projected tax supported deficit. In the first quarter of 2024, after the 2023 year end results are finalized, if tax supported operations end the year with an unfavorable budget position, the budget shortfall will be offset by the FSR. Depending on the magnitude of the shortfall, the FSR may fall below its minimum balance. As currently projected, the FSR balance would be $93 million in 2024 if tax supported operations end 2023 with an unfavorable budget variance of $52 million. In this case, the FSR will would fall below its minimum balance by approximately $30.5 million. In accordance with the policy, in the event that the appropriate, unappropriate FSR falls below the minimum, a strategy must be adopted to achieve the minimum balance over a period not to exceed three years, starting with the subsequent year's operating budget. As a result, a strategy may need to be implemented starting with the 2025 operating budget to replenish the FSR to its minimum balance from 2025 to 2027. The strategy may include replenishing the FSR with any unplanned one-time revenues, savings through one-time cost reduction strategies, previously committed one-time appropriated items within the FSR that are no longer required for their original purpose, or a transfer of funds from other reserves where the amounts are no longer required for their original purpose. A multi-year tax levy could also be considered. As discussed during the fall 2023 supplemental operating budget discussion in November, 
beginning in 2025 under the assumption of an even replenishment plan over three years through tax levy, an annual contribution of 10.2 million would be necessary to restore the FSR to its required minimum balance. The financial implications of this strategy would result in a 0.48% tax increase in 2025. This would be in addition to the tax increase already proposed in the 12th fall SOBA. The budget will be adjusted on an ongoing basis and base increase for 2026 and 2027 will be transferred to the FSR. If no further deficit is incurred, the $10.2 million can be used to reduce the tax levy in 2028 or are reallocated to other service needs. It is important to acknowledge that the stri actual strategy may evolve based on the future tax supported positions and whether tax supported operations end the year with surpluses or deficits in subsequent years. Additionally, the minimum target balance will be subject to change based on current year expenditures, calculated as a percentage of 5% and 8% res respectively. The year-end year projected balance for the Planning and Development Reserve is $42.4 million, which is above the minimum target of $17.1 million. The projected, the projected year-end balance for the Traffic Safety and Automated Enforcement Reserve for 2023 is $5.9 million, which is above the minimum required balance of $1.2 million. There is higher than budgeted revenues due to higher in incidences of speed violations as well as higher average fines per ticket. That's the end of our presentation. We'll be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you so much. I think uh, what we will do, because uh, there'll be a number of questions, I think we'll take a break here and uh, we'll come back at 1.30. Maybe time we'll, specific at one thirty. Well, yeah, we actually have a, yeah, that's right, that's a good point, like, then we should not be starting. So we'll have a, when we come back, after we have done, dealt with the time specifics, which are three items, uh, we'll be back at this item then, okay. Thanks. Until then, we are on recess.
Five, Councillor Paquette. All right, well, thank you and welcome back. Uh, we are going to proceed at this point with our transit and downtown safety update, which uh, for those following along is item 7.3. And uh, I will do a quick roll call. So, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Principe. Hello. Hello, Councillor Stevenson will be joining us, uh, I believe, shortly. I am here. Uh, Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. The mayor is away on city business at this time. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, I think I heard you on the line. Yes, hello. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. I know she's around, so we'll circle back on that. Uh, Councillor Salvador. Hello. Hello. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. I am certain he'll be joining us soon. Uh, Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And Councillor Jens. Hello. Hello. And we have Councillor Carmel present. Okay. And Councillor Stevenson. Hello. Oh, excellent. Hello. And Councillor Councillor Hamilton. Okay. So. Uh, Councillor Hamilton's here as well. And Councillor Hamilton's here as well. Perfect. So we have quorum and uh, we are ready to begin on item 7.3 and I uh, understand there's a report, a verbal report. Thank you very much, Councillor Paquette and Council. Uh, we are here today to provide the last verbal update of the year on the Enhanced Transit Safety Plan, Downtown Core and Chinatown. With us today is Robbie Caboni, our Supervisor of Community Services from Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Society. We also have Dr. Sarah Schulman, a lead partner within With Forward. We have Inspector Jared uh, Hertzun, we have Superintendent Keith Johnson. Uh, we have Superintendent Derek McIntyre from the EPS, and we have Deputy Chief Warren Dreichel as well from the EPS. From its city administration, uh, we're joined by Eddie Robar, Deputy City Manager for Operations, Jennifer Flamin, Deputy City Manager for Community Services, Carrie Houghton McDonald, our Branch Manager of Edmonton Transit Service, David Jones, our Branch Manager of Community Standards and Neighborhoods, Dwayne Hunter, Director of Transit Safety, and Tom Gervin beside me from uh, our Director of Downtown Vibrancy. Before we begin, I do want to acknowledge the two serious incidents that took place recently at Coliseum Station and Transit Centre. And I just wanted to say we're really disheartened by these incidents and our thoughts continue to be with the individuals involved. We know that the impacts of tragic events like this stretch well beyond the people and the families directly involved. And experience like, experiences like this affect how Edmontonians view the entire transit system. And we know there is more work to be done and more progress to be made and we're committed to doing this work with our partners on behalf of all Edmontonians and reporting uh, back to Council on the progress. Today's update will include an overview of the broader work with other orders of government, uh, updates on the work happening in and around downtown and Chinatown, information and insights we are gathering from traditional research and unconventional engagement opportunities, how the partners continue to advance the safety work through data-informed decisions, and what our next steps are to get us through the winter and into the spring. We know we need to be mindful of the root causes when we're working on transit safety, and because that happens, uh, because of what happens on transit and what is happening across the entire community and in other communities. Under the umbrella of the Community Safety and Wellbeing Strategy, the City of Edmonton is doing its part to address social issues. And we know that sustainable solutions require the work to be done in partnership with community. The partnerships we have formed and strengthened through the enhanced transit safety work have, been a, uh, have made a very uh, good difference, I would say, in many areas. The city and our partners remain committed to safe transit system and we're working with orders, other orders of government to share our specific needs and identify opportunities to work together. At the municipal level, we've increased funding provided by council, uh, which allows us to start addressing frontline staff to response expectations. And I'm proud to share that we have filled the 38 new transit peace officer positions and they are now active in transit spaces. And we certainly front-ended uh, most of those positions for frontline staff. And those staff and the partners in, in the other organizations are connecting people and programs. At the provincial level, the government of Alberta committed to 1,700 permanent and temporary emergency shelter spaces for the winter of 23 and 24, and we continue to keep council informed on that progress. 
There were also recent announcements for additional Alberta sheriffs and through Bill 3, consideration to recover opioid-related health care costs and other damages from organizations which have contributed to the crisis. The province has also opened an expanded emergency room at the Misericordia Hospital, which has more robust mental health supports and increased funding for the Family and Community Support Services Program, or FCSS. At the federal level, the Senate passed Bill C-48 with some amendments at the end of November, and this bill will impose more stringent requirements for the release of violent and repeat offenders, which is something Council has advocated for urgent action on, given tragedies that have, have occurred in our community. Through the Building Safe for Communities Fund, the federal government also announced an investment of more than $4.2 million for crime prevention in Edmonton, and that was announced on December 1st, and the city is helping to disperse these funds to address gung and gang, gung and gang uh, prevalence. I'd now like to turn it over to Tom Gervin for an update on downtown vibrancy. Tom. Thanks, Andre. Uh, we're wrapping up a successful year of supporting projects led by businesses and organizations through the Downtown Vibrancy Fund. Applications are now closed and will reopen in early 2024 with a continued focus on supporting sustained downtown vibrancy. This year we awarded $3.5 million to 131 projects that have brought more people downtown to live, work, play and visit. This includes the Edmonton Downtown Business Association's Night Patrol project, which helps to improve nighttime safety for Edmonton's downtown businesses, workers, visitors and residents. Night Night Patrol recorded 654 incidents across 11 categories from January to August in 2024. The window repair program um, has also awarded 131 businesses nearly $200,000 in funding to date and was recently expanded to provide additional supports to businesses dealing with the impacts of vandalism. Unison Downtown is a public safety deployment technology developed internally at the City of Edmonton it brings together da data from various city departments and partner organizations and presents it in a way that facilitates actionable insights for our internal teams and partners on the front line. It's currently using data from Edmonton Fire Rescue Services, corporate security, community standards and neighborhoods, 24-7 crisis diversion, Edmonton Transit Service, Edmonton Employee Safety Data, and Edmonton Police Services Community Safety Data Portal. It's important to note that Unison does not use any personally identifiable information and was subjected to a privacy and data ethics assessment. A downtown version of Unison was recently completed and is currently being rolled out to partners for their use. These partners include the Downtown Business Association's Night Patrol and Ambassador Initiatives, City Centre Mall, JW Marriott Hotel and ATB. This is just the beginning. The intention is to share the Unison technology wildly to support an overall picture of public safety and a truly integrated approach internally and amongst our partners. As we enter the winter season, celebrating Edmonton as a safe winter city is a priority. To support this, we have funded 27 projects to date and supported by a combination of downtown vibrancy funding, federal funding and private investment dollars. I'm happy to report that over $2 million has been spent on lighting projects that will animate downtown Brighton downtown pedways, building exteriors, and the Civic Centre in the long term. This includes Commerce Place, Edmonton City Centre, Energy Square, Stantec, the City Hall rink lights, um, snowflake lights that you'll see on the light stanchions, and the Lucian spheres that are adorning our Churchill Square Plaza for the next couple of months. Now I'll turn it over to Brett Latchford, Director of Strategy and Emerging Economy, to discuss t Chinatown. Thank you, Tom. In Chinatown, we recently completed a safety data audit and it catalogs three years of publicly available safety data. This will act as a benchmark starting point when we evaluate factors that impact the community's sense of safety in future, year, future years. The safety data audit was a deliverable in the Chinatown strategy. The $1 million, China, $1 million Chinatown recovery fund has been fully distributed. 70% of the funds went towards safety and security measures. The recipients of these funds have expressed extreme gratitude for the improvements they report not only lower incidents of damage, but greatly relieved stress levels. As we receive reporting back from these grants, we are compiling the results into a summary report on the Chinatown Recovery Fund that will be made available in quarter one of 2024. Also in quarter one of 2024, the city will launch its Chinatown Vibrancy Grant, which will allow funding for community-led initiatives that enhance social cohesion and cultural preservation, 
It will support events and festivals and cultural activities that draw visitors back into Chinatown, and it will provide resources for community organizations to offer programs that empower residents, housed and unhoused alike. The Chinatown Transformation Collaborative is working on a program to support the businesses that receive uh, rural shutters as part of the funding of the Chinatown Recovery Fund. They will be decorating these shutters in traditional uh, Chinatown manner, and the Chinatown BIA, BIA is running a similar program with its members with customized designs on the rural shutters, which are graffiti resistant. In both North and South Chinatown, we continue to conduct safety walks on a quarterly basis in order to address safety concerns. Safety walks include Edmonton Police Services, peace officers, and community safety liaisons from the Healthy Streets team, as well as the Chinatown Recovery team. Safety walks are typically attended by business owners and operators, cultural and religious organizations, and representatives from the organizations in Chinatown, including the BIA, the CTC, and the Chinatown Benevolent Association. They are, however, open to all. The last two safety walks included 25 distinct locations that were visited and included 14 reports to 311. During these walks, community members share insights that includes the times of day where there are issues, where, more frequent location, where, the, where are the more frequent locations that are seeing the most vandalism, graffiti, and drug activity, and where fires are happening. Common themes in Chinatown North, so north of 104 Ave, include concerns about individuals entering businesses and occupying bathrooms, sometimes asking for free products and refusing to leave, fires in abandoned buildings, and a general increase in disorder after 5 p.m. In Chinatown South, also known as the Quarters, the residents share that they are grateful to see an increased presence of peace officers in the alleyways, but remain concerned about a potential increase in encampments, similar to what they've observed at the last two winters. Overall, attendees continue to share their appreciation in meeting with the Healthy Streets teams, and these safety walks will continue quarterly in both North and South Chinatown. Healthy Streets teams and the Chinatown Recovery Team are also working together to follow up on the items that are catalogued, and we are assisting community organizations with grant writing for a Provincial Safety Infrastructure Grant. With that, I will turn it over to Dwayne Hunter, Director of Transit Safety. Over the last four months, in collaboration with ETS, the City of Edmonton's Recover Urban Wellbeing and Transit Safety Teams, we've been prototyping Oracle through In With Forward. This is an example of an unconventional approach we are taking to reach transit riders to better understand their first-hand experiences. <clears throat> We've been asking, how can we engage people that conventional surveys do not reach in ways that enhance well-being? How can we expand our notion of data, engage community in data collection, analysis, and interpretation? How can we move forward beyond single stories and dominant narratives to holistically explore the relationship between connection and safety? At the heart of Oracle is a new role called local listeners. Everyday Edmontonians trained to use creative community engagement and narrative-based research methods. Since August, local listeners have gathered 175 stories from a real diversity of people about moments on or around transit that mattered. Here's an excerpt of one such story. I'm a transit user, I don't drive. Um, I also bring my kids on transit. Uh, they wanted to go to Tellus World of Science. Um, it's a very long bus ride from where I'm at. And my youngest is, um, she has Down syndrome and autism. And she was facing somebody that had, that had a missing limb. He looked like he was homeless. He um, had a, his leg was pinned up. But, and my daughter, because of the way I was positioned and I had nowhere to move, because of her autism, she loves things that flap. So she took his pants and started pulling on them because the one leg was just not there. I was mortified. I tried to back her up, but there was simply no room for anything. And I really apologized to this gentleman. And I said, I'm really, really sorry. And he said to me, sorry, he said, most people won't even look at me Never mind, touch me. So it's fine for your daughter to play with my pat leg. And so she did. I, we talked a little bit um, about each other and, and stuff, and it was a lovely conversation. So I said, oh, well, this is our bus stop. We're going to tell us. And he, um, he took his, all his change out of his pant pocket. And he said, I'd like you to buy her an ice cream. And I said, no, I can't 
I can't take your money. He says, she made me feel human. And this is what I have. And it, that's worth at least something. So just take it. So I did take the money. I did buy her an ice cream. And she made a big mess because she's got Down syndrome. And stopped all over herself. But that was okay. It, I think, I wish, I wish that I would have invited him to tell us to have the day with us. Stories like these are being made available through a dashboard that aggregates patterns and invites the community to help make sense of the data, including at the recent Nosy Fest where over 600 people were welcomed to do collective meaning making. Participants told us how transformative having someone listen to their life story can be. Some of the early insights emerging include, across the diversity of stories, we saw, see how interactions on transit have power to transform a day. Human connection can be an antidote both frustration and fear. The levers for strengthening human connection are distinct from the tools of surveillance and enforcement. They are about shifting perceptions of others, cultivating empathy and mutual respect and celebrating a culture of care. Next slide, please. During the last two months, the number of non-criminal incidents has grown slightly, but as a proportion of total rides remains low. As a reminder, non-criminal incidents are not violations of the criminal code. Criminal incidents are tracked by EPS. Non-criminal incidents are tracked by ETS to continually better understand the rider experience. In incidents can include nuisance and disorder, littering, graffiti or vandalism, and reported medical incidents. In our last update, we shared that the number of non-criminal incidents was 1,438 in August and 1,546 in September. This has grown in October and November, and the proportion of incidents compared to total rides has also increased slightly, from 0.037% in September to 0.044% in October. Overall, ridership across the system continues to grow. We're up 18% year over year from October, with 5.2 million rides across the system. We don't have a full month's worth of data for November, yet, so we're showing interim results for the first three weeks of the month. Next slide. Dispatch calls for service can differ from final event types. When a call is received by 911 or a non-emergency call evaluator, it is categorized by event type based on the initial information provided by the caller. After an investigation is complete, if required, the event type is updated. This slide highlights the final event type. Included here are both dispatch calls for service and proactive on-view events for all LRT stations and transit centres, excluding the Valley Line Southeast. Nonviolent events have risen by 82 calls compared to last year, which is attributed to the number of warrant arrests executed by police tracks, as well as assist other agency type calls. Arrests and integrated proactive work in transit spaces is believed to have contributed to the drop of 45 violent events. To make data-driven decisions and better understand what picture is being painted by the volume and types of calls captured within transit facilities and spaces, we work through an integrated transit data committee. The committee is represented by work areas within the City of Edmonton, Edmonton Police Service and Bentero Traditional Healing Society. As this committee continues to evolve, we will better understand what measures are better for reporting as compared to working data. Ultimately, this group will be able to identify what authorities are required in a specific transit location and at what time. To further enhance transit safety, we will analyze the types of criminal incidents that are occurring in transit spaces and develop targeted responses. Next slide, please. At a past council presentation, there were concerns around the time delay in the crime severity measure. We thought it'd be worthwhile noting in this update that due to the complexity of this measure, it does take longer to produce. However, the EPS are able to provide the previous quarter results. For this presentation, they provided the information up until the end of Q3. The calls for service data presented in the previous slide are for October 1st until November 21st. Those numbers highlight the quantity of calls received by EPS. To provide additional understanding around the severity of crime that is occurring in transit spaces, we are relying on the nationally supported crime severity index. Crime severity tends to capture the seriousness of the crimes. While the overall trend of crime severity is down from Q1 in 2022 
and calls for service due to violent offenses have decreased. There has been a slight rise lately in the severity of incidents representing a 2.1% increase from Q2 to Q3 in 2023. This ensures we are looking at each instance through an equitable lens. In other words, not all criminal offenses are equal and require a tailored response to have an impact. What the data is telling us is that while we have experienced a drop in violent events, the incidents that have occurred tend to be more serious. Since the beginning of 2022, the average crime severity, a blend of violent and non-violent crime severity measures, has trended down, which is very positive. When comparing Q2 and Q3 of this year, there was an increase of 7.6% in average severity. This increase is due to the 18.9% increase in violent crime severity and the 1.2% decrease in non-violent crime severity. Next slide, please. Successes realized through the Enhanced Transit Safety Plan is attributed to partnerships. When we have data that informs us of the challenges and unique needs of our city and transit system, we are better able to bridge to sustainable solutions. As you know, the Community Outreach Transit Team, or COT, is a partnership between the City of Edmonton and Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Society. COT currently operates seven days a week from 6 a.m. to 3 a.m. This started on December 4th and, and previously was running until 2 a.m. Currently, there are seven teams. As we have mentioned before, multiple interactions are often needed before someone in, is in need feels safe enough to accept a connection to a support. As we previously talked about in May of this year, COT started running a booth on Tuesday and Thursday mornings in Churchill Station. The booth allows us to interact with significantly more individuals than we would if we were only doing our proactive and reactive patrols. This booth is a precursor to the permanent location that is being prepared for us in Central Station. I'd like to pass it over to Robbie Caboni, Supervisor of Community Services with Bent Arrow, who will speak to the work being done at this booth. We have had lots of success with this booth, a set location at set times of the day where folks can find the COT team members allows people to come to COT for information and resources. Because we only because we have only one or two teams on at any given time, the booth allows uh, us to reach many more people than we would if we were only doing proactive and reactive patrol. You can see on this slide that over 20% of all interactions and engagements occur at the COT booth. While not pictured on the slide, I would like to highlight that support for access to government issued IDs is one of the biggest requests for support that vulnerable Edmontonians have. Replacing or renewing your Alberta ID for one year costs $14, but the combination of the, pro the process, it takes people's literacy levels, both digital and reading and writing literacy, and lack of access to $14 often proves to be impossible barrier to overcome without support. For instance, one of our team members worked with an elderly man from a reserve outside of Edmonton. As they got to know him, they learned that he had a bank account but didn't have a bank card anymore and because he didn't have ID he couldn't replace his card. The team member worked with him to get ID from his reserve then went to the bank with him to re-establish his ability to access his account. This took 14 days to regain his identification. Once that was complete the bank account access was regained. They filled out H applications and completed taxes and filled out applications for housing. In the meantime, the gentleman was living rough by choice. He didn't feel safe going to shelters. Once they accessed his account, they discovered he had previously signed up for many of the financial resources he was eligible for and had accumulated $30,000 in his bank account. The deposits had just continued even though he had no knowledge of how to access the funds. Once he had regained access to his own money, he was immediately rehoused and was able to support himself. We often speak about access to housing, addiction recovery supports, and various forms of health resources as fundamentally to successfully transitioning people into better spaces. But access to all these services is typically contingent upon having proper identification. We are pleased that COD is able to support individuals in this very basic way. This is a quick snapshot of the advancements we are making through community outreach and transit spaces. By creating connections to people in transit spaces, we are supporting the facilitation to support unique 
to the unique supports of their needs. Over time, we expect our efforts to be reflected in the higher perceptions of safety, fewer incidents, and higher ridership. Next slide, please. In addition to coordinating efforts around serious incidents, the team has also been delivering the winter plan, which included dedicated shelter shuttle service. With many more people turning to transit spaces during the winter for support services, a collaborative plan was developed based on the successes of existing plans and partnerships like the extreme weather response in order to improve the safety of all Edmontonians. The winter plan has included working with a third party transit provider to deliver the, sh uh, the shuttle service and Boyle Street community services to provide support workers on board. Administration has also worked on wayfinding materials such as signage, bus decals, and increased communication at transit stations to increase awareness of the service. Launched November 1st, the shuttle service accommodated over 300 transfers in its first month. The premise is simple but effective. Literally meet people where they are at in order to provide them with the immediate and appropriate to their specific needs supports. With additional shelter space, shuttling service, outreach, police and TPOs, opportunities exist to bridge more people to shelter and prevent violent, non-violent and disorder type incidents. We also continue to monitor the number of people removed from transit spaces at the end of service. While numbers are significantly lower this year, the numbers have climbed as temperatures have cooled. In addition to the shuttle services, upgrades have been made to over 500 doors at Capital and Metro Line LRT and transit stations to better secure stations after hours. In addition, 40 new security cameras of more than 1,200 total have been installed. In strong collaboration with our partners, including TPOs, shelter providers, bus operations, COT and Boyle Street, we are integrating into enhancing the resources and approaches already underway, including the extreme weather response as part of our winter, plan, our winter plan. We look forward to reporting on the results of the efforts at the next Council update. Beyond transit, the efforts shared with you today are expected to help advance broader city strategies and Council priorities, such as the safe and inclusive spaces pillar of the community safety and well-being strategy and the Edmonton's goal to be the safest city in Canada by 2030. This concludes our update for today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the presentation and uh, all the work that uh, the integrated uh, teams have been doing on, uh, on this very, very important uh, issue that is on uh, not only Council's mind, but Edmontonians' mind and those who use the system every day. And, uh, their well-being and safety is uh, is top of mind for everyone. So thank you so much for the, all the hard work that you have been uh, have been doing. At this time, I will uh, ask council members to sign up if they have questions to uh, uh, to the delegation. This was exempted by Council Hamilton, but she is away on uh, on official responsibility, and uh, we will uh, start with other questions. Oh, here you go. Here's the list. Councillor Salvador, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate the ongoing collaboration between all partners um, and the, the excellent presentation and overview. Uh, for my first set of questions, I uh, just want to focus on uh, proactive patrols and deployments to transit. Uh, I have seen a fair amount of data shared recently um, from EPS around uh, incident statistics on transit, uh, which stations are seeing the most crime, type of crime, et cetera. Um, can you provide some detail around how that is informing deployment? Councillor, were you looking for an EPS response yes. or a TPS? I, uh, I'd be looking for EPS on that one. Councillor, um, I guess we're constantly evaluating the data as we receive it um, and finding some new ways to potentially deploy our resources a little more effectively with regard to um, some of the crimes that have happened and then some of the incidents that we can start to predict. Uh, I know that we're at EPS are working collaboratively with the City of Edmonton um, with some software called Risk Terrain Modeling. Uh, that will ideally give us a better idea of where some of these instances are occurring and why they're occurring there and how we can better deploy our resources, um, I guess, to combat that and any displacement that might occur after that. Okay, so just to 
<clears throat> maybe through, thank you for that answer, and maybe through an example, um, you know, I, I think we're all aware Coliseum Station, for example, has the, the second most incidents uh, across all transit centers. Um, and we've, we've known that for a while, the data shows that. Um, I'm just really looking to understand how do we draw that line between we have this data, we know this is the reality on transit. Are we, have we increased the numbers of proactive patrols on the EPS's side that are, that are at that particular station? I'm fairly new to my position. I've been here for uh, a month and a week. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm still trying to kind of figure out how our, our tracks teams, so our transit community safety teams, which are dedicated solely to uh, Edmonton Transit, deploy themselves. Um, I'm not sure if any of my counterparts might be able to offer some more specific grounds as to when and why we deploy to somewhere like Commonwealth or Coliseum specifically. Um, yeah, we can uh, can add a little bit of context to it. Like currently, our our tracks, our police transit uh, police uh, started in early June, and that encompasses uh, three teams of one sergeant and six constables. Our data uh, data drives intelligence. So part of what we would always promote is if uh, if you see something, say something. Uh, our our intel is starting to flow quite nicely where we are able to determine uh, based on incidents that have occurred certain times of day where we would want our officers to be deployed. Right, right. And just on, uh, correct me if I heard you, maybe, I don't know if I heard you correctly. Uh, was it uh, three teams of four? Uh, three, t three teams of uh, one supervisor okay. and, and six constables. That's where we're at currently. Okay, so a total number, mm. is that? 21. Okay, and that's for the entire transit system? That's correct. Okay. Um, are you able to, so that they came online in June, did you say? Would it be possible to get some numbers around, uh, I guess, um, I'm looking to see the shift in resources towards transit given how much we're talking about transit and how um, how much of a concern that is for Edmontonians, I guess. Is there, is there data that you can share with us that you can show um, in recognition of the uh, concerns we're seeing on transit, we are deploying X more number of officers to transit? Yeah, we, we do have, uh, the members actually account for their time very, very well. You know, current to date, I mean, they're, uh, right now you're looking at approximately 12,100 actual contacts that, that our members make in the transit space. That's just not the LRTs, but those are also your other transit stations as well, such as, you know, your Kingsway, uh, Millwoods, Jasper Place. Uh, on top of that, you know, we, they have uh, executed uh, approximately 4,200 warrants. Uh, you're looking at a number of 400 plus people being charged for separate criminal offenses. Now that's just essentially the, um, the data that we can provide. We can, we can also state how many hours that they're spending at each location. Uh, one of the main focuses when the new line opened, uh, what I did direct uh, our tracks uh, officers that they do spend the time on the new line uh, just to show visibility. To, uh, the focus was, the mission was, it's not, it's not about enforcement, it's about making people feel safe. And we do know uh, if any of the councillors did attend the Safe Cities Conference, there was a little sidebar where the Vancouver Transit Police did a seminar for a period of time. And we do know when there's lots of riders on the train that people are safe. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that uh, Vancouver stressed very, very uh, strongly. It's those off times and, what so and we need to be able to have our proper intel, which we are getting, so that we can deploy our members in a specific place at a specific time. We do spend a lot of time reacting, uh, but remember as well, you're looking at uh, currently 18 police officers, and this is why we rely so much on our transit peace officers and our community peace officers uh, that outnumber us a fair bit in order to uh, in order to assist on that visibility standpoint. But with 18 officers, and I'm sorry, I don't know the updated numbers of the number of stations we have, but that is quite limited because mm -hmm. you're looking at a, one sergeant and six constables deployed at a time. Yeah, thank you so much for. Uh, Councillor Salvador, could I jump in and provide a little I'm bit way more? Over time. <laughs> uh, come, I'll back, come back. Come back for another round. Come back for you know. Uh, might there might be similar questions from other co colleagues, right? So you can respond to. Uh, Councillor Paquette. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you for your efforts uh, with the uh, tracks teams. 
I just want to follow up on some of the questions that Councillor Salvador was asking, and that is, uh, you know, we're talking about perception, we're talking about data, and uh, looking at uh, the incidents, um, you know, we can go to the public and say, based on on this data, you're, you're statistically safer on transit than in a car, for example, but the experience is much different. And so one of the things that you pointed out was that having a lot of people on the cars makes people safe, but in the times when there aren't a lot of people, is that when you're upping the presence uh, of uh, constables and the tracks teams uh, to transit? In the times when, as far as perception goes, people need to see that presence? I think that's something we'll definitely need to look at. Uh, again, as I stated, I'm new in my position, but I, I think that that's probably something, as the superintendent brought up and you echoed, that if there's less people on the transit, it should be something where we can try to devote more of our resources at that time. And it seems kind of counterintuitive, but uh, it does make sense. Yeah, like I, I get it. When there's more people, you're like, oh, maybe we need more folks to, uh, you know, engage and even possibly enforce. And that's probably true to a certain extent. But when there's less people, there's more opportunity. There's less barriers to uh, um, social disturbances, I would say. Yeah, and to piggyback the inspector's comments, it's, uh, you know, with uh, police, but it's, it's our partners as well. It's our transit peace officers, our community peace officers, and the collaboration that uh, uh, that EPS does with uh, Dwayne and his teams. Uh, that uh, you know, can we always do a better job as far as deployment goes? Yes. Uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, focuses that we want again is visibility. Our members do spend a lot of time in the nooks and crannies of the tunnels. Um, that's something that they need to do from a safety perspective, but. We do know that the visibility means everything. And our, uh, call it our, our uh, uh, chronic non-payer types that do hang out and using those spaces for illegitimate and illegal purposes is that they do know the difference when, they do know when the police are there. Uh, they do recognize uh, it all goes by the stripe on our, on our pants. They see the red stripe and they realize that we are there conducting our proactive activities and that, uh, that we will address any disorder that we come across, and again, in order to make people feel safe. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. And I guess the same question goes for our peace officers, as far as presence and the timing of that presence. So we have to balance our various obligations in the transit system. Uh, so the, the transit, the, the, the regular patrol folks work 24 seven. Um, all the way through the year and so we do our best but we also know that we don't want to leave too few people on overnight when we're trying to you know look after people that are servicing the the locations having to close the facilities at night that kind of thing uh, so our, our regular tpos work 24 7 we spread them out as best we can uh, the tcat foot patrol teams uh, work two different shifts seven in the morning till uh, six o'clock in the evening and then um, yeah, no, that's 2 p.m. till 1 in the morning. Yeah, okay, so yes or no, are we deploying based on when we know the perception uh, is greatest? Our, we want to target both, uh, so yes. Oh yeah, of course we want to target yeah, both. We, we want to target those rush hour periods where people are moving, but uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, when there are fewer people around, we want to make sure that we have some sort of routine presence as well, just to make sure yeah. that people. S so Edmontonians can still. expect that, like fairly soon. Yeah, and our our goal is to work with the EPS to make sure that we're not we're not too many yeah. at the same place at the yeah. same well, time. The we want to make sure that because it's a it's a fairly easy win as far as perception goes. I would say that it's you know good PR for. Uh, you know, our services that say we're going to keep you safe, people can actually see it keeping them safe. Councillor Paquette, I could also add there that <clears throat> now that we have dedicated police on transit, we've been sharing our data and bringing it together to work with Superintendent McIntyre and myself to get a complete picture of transit so we know exactly the times, exactly the locations, and what would be the appropriate authority in that space. We're making it there, still have a ways to go. Right but it's the first times we've been sharing the data to this level. So it's not that we're not going out there right now and being data-led, we are. 
We're just taking it another step further so we get better at it. Thank you, Councilor Brigade. Councilor Tang. Um, great. Thank you very much for um, the coordinated presentation and, um, of course, for all your frontline service and work um, to make and keep us, uh, the public, safe. Um, I, I want to start with some just clarifying questions based on the presentation, and then I want to dig a little bit deeper into um, the Oracle project, as I think that's a, a new thread that we haven't heard uh, in previous transit safety updates. Um, so I just want to give that heads up as the delegation gets ready. Um, maybe I'll start at the beginning. I, I think, uh, Mr. Corbel, you have just, you know, I'm not familiar with the, the I'm not too familiar with the Bill 3. Um, and, you know, would that, would that Recovery Amendment Act kind of address the things like that we put towards additional, say, public washrooms as part of Shigella response and that kind of stuff? I think it could. I don't know if it will. Okay. Uh, what happens with the recovery of those funds I, we, is unclear to us at okay. this point, but I, but I like the idea of that. Okay. Um, but I, I'm not sure yet whether we'll just go into the general revenue yeah. um, or it would be a dedicated piece. So that's not unclear to us at this point. Gotcha. Thank you. And then in that same slide, it also said $21 million more FCSS funding. Is that just for Edmonton or all of province? I don't know. I'll just see if okay. anybody else has the answer to that. Yeah, and I'll be curious to know kind of how much that of that would be dedicated to Edmonton. Yeah, we can get that answered. Um, and then uh, I know we talked about this during the Chinatown strategy presentation, but for the f for the vibrancy fund, where is that money coming from? Hi, uh, it's coming from internal from uh, uh, Mr. Gervan's budget, where there was some extra surplus identified. Yeah, it 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 wasn't part of the. Uh, Council approved $5 million. It was a separate fund that was uh, designed for a community, community benefit, so it was assigned from that. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think you also mentioned the night patrol that they reported incidents. Um, can you just repeat those numbers for me again? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I'll come back to you as no. you as you look that Apologies. up. Apologies, 654 yeah. incidents across 11 categories for the first um, eight months of the year. And then would that be coordinated with our peace officers, our EPS, and like everybody has that information? Yeah, so it's not a, it's not a replacement for any of those services. It's simply another mechanism to help highlight and report opportunities. So um, and then the incidences are reported to the appropriate authorities for action um, and. You know, the, the service that EDBA provides will continue to evolve as the, as the program continues. Mm -hmm. um, maybe to Mr. Hunter, perhaps. Um, you know, one constituent of mine, uh, you know, emailed in to kind of point out to me that the overall, you know, we hear so much about violent incidents in, in transit spaces, um, as that's widely reported, you know, that's what's on social media, uh, but there's an overall increase in violence uh, across the city. I'm wondering if anyone can sort of comment on that. Um, I'm, I'm looking at you, maybe I'll start there. Can you comment on that a little bit um, and just put some things um, into, con into context there? So you'd like me to comment across the city, Councillor? Yeah, but like, are you, you know, is that a trend, for example? You know, when I see that slide about what is a provincial investment, what is a federal investment, you know, I'm thinking a lot of this isn't just going to address transit safety issues, but some of the overall increase in violent incident um, across the city. I wouldn't be able to get in those exact stat, uh, stats, but I can explain that the things that we're wrestling with in transit and the hard to tackle um, things are what the rest of the community are fighting the homelessness the opioid epidemic and all of those types of things so the money that went the 1.5 million from the city to the uh, building safer communities fund will go directly to gang prevention and gang exit strategies and things like that so that money there will go to support not only transit but the bigger picture so those by doing the bigger work and the broader work, it will have, it'll eventually have a positive impact on transit for mm -hmm. sure. I mean, I know in this same, you know, agenda, we're gonna be looking at the, the EPS annual data um, that I think there'll be a lot of parallel perhaps, and you know, a, a lot of connections there. 
Um, and I just in my maybe 13 seconds, I'll just say I thought that was a really powerful story you shared. And I'm very curious uh, to ask about, you know, more stories like that. To, and more importantly, what do you do with information like that? So that'll be my next round. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Jans. Councilor Jans. Oh, sorry, Councilor Jans, before I go to you, just hold on. I would like to welcome some students joining us from Mayo Kimmel School. Uh, they are here with their uh, teacher, Mrs. M. Davis, and your ward counselor is Councillor Tang, who was just asking questions to administration and the delegation, Ward Gary Hio. Thank you so much for joining us. Are you here just for the day? Yes. And are, are you having fun so far? Yes. Did you do your mock council? Yes. Ooh. What was the topic of discussion? Who was the mayor? Mayor, what is your name, sir? Huh? Gurtaj, Mayor Gurtaj. You want to come down here to the microphone? Come on, rush, hurry up. <laughs> this is our new tradition now. Every time school comes in, they have a debate on topics. We invite them, the mayor, we invite the mayor to come to the microphone and share. What they were, so what did you talk about, Mayor Gurtaj? What did you talk about? What was your topic of discussion? Should all Edmonton transit services be free for all citizens? Ooh. Well, we are talking about transit, how we make transit safe, right? And so what did you decide? We decided to be against the vote. Okay, can you give me one reason why against, one reason why in favor? Against? Yes. Yeah. If? It was like for free, people like homeless people will like hog it and then they'll just stay on it for all day and sometimes misuse it. Okay, and what is the reason for not make, uh, for making it free? People like there'll be more jobs for transit services. Okay. Like to like clean up and like so homeless people can find jobs at transit services to be free. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Welcome. <laughs> Enjoy. Enjoy your stay, okay? Lovely seeing you. All right, now go to Councillor Jans. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if we could get a, uh, a bit of a typology of who we're arresting? Like what is the age of who we're arresting? Yeah, that information counselor I do not have. Okay, um, how about race? That I don't have either. So uh, how about people we're arresting who have already been arrested previously? Do we have that? Well, that's something we would need to take away in order to do research through a formal request from your office. Sure. Uh, that, this is like this is my working theory, is that um, many of the folks who are coming to transit are coming from encampments, and uh, many of the folks in encampments are coming from the jails and the criminal justice system, and uh, I'm wondering about sub sort of substantiating this. Who is? Because I, I don't think a lot of folks just decide to begin a life of crime on transit. I'm trying to understand. I guess who, like, are are we? Because I'm, what I'm what I'm hearing is there's going to be a zero tolerance approach on encampments. I'm hearing that from elements. Now, if we do that, are all those folks who were in encampments going to end up on transit and un and like undo all of your good work? Do you, do you sort of follow my concern? I don't yeah, know if somebody I, wants to take that. Yeah, I follow. I mean, uh, the main uh, evidence that we have is that any person that we've arrested on transit platforms uh, has not paid and that the disorder and the crime and disorder that we see is uh, is is essentially is that the individuals who are who come in contact with us are using that space for illegitimate purposes and which is hence is why the interaction occurs either a, a person has warrants for the arrest or whether it's uh, possession weapons etc so sorry just to clarify so the I guess the um, the inciting incident, if you will, of uh, is fair evasion. 
well, a lot of times is uh, a part of, and this is a peace officer's work, along with the police officer's work, because it's important to know with tracks is that um, when you only have, say, one and six, you know, one, one supervisor, six constables working, uh, if there's an event occurring, say, at Century, and uh, they're up in Clearview, uh, they're not going to uh, spend the, that amount of time in order to go down uh, all those stops in order to take over the arrest. So the majority, high percentage of the works of our transit police officers is purely proactive work. And that's engaging with the public, dealing with the disorder, dealing with crime and addressing when necessary. Okay. Um, we had a ride along at Southgate a little while ago and I, I just wanna say I really, really appreciated it. It was very helpful. We had the TPOs, we had tracks, we had facilities, we had everybody, it was very, very good. So I. I, I really, yeah, I, I just wanted to express gratitude for that too. Um, as I'm looking at, I don't know what slide this is. I wanna say it's slide seven. It has the dispatch calls for service at LRT stations. Now, is that an average? Like for example, in 2023, it said there were 248 nonviolent, uh, I don't know if the clerk can pull slides or not. Or, I don't, it says there's 200, 248 nonviolent calls in, uh, in 2023 during the October 1 to November 21. Is that average per station or is that the entirety of the system? Councilor, that's the entirety of the system. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. I, I think it, for future, I think understanding better the nature of the disorder on transit would be um, very helpful, like who, who are those folks? So I'll work with, I guess, the clerk then to craft maybe a subsequent motion or something. Um, uh, because I, again, I'm, I'm the, the point about the encampments there too. Um, do, have we had any gun related incidents on transit? Yes. Was there a shooting or what was there? There's been possession of weapons calls numerous times in the past. I, have, I don't know when the most recent is. I could pass it over to the TPOs or to the EPS, but we've had them in the past. But thankfully, no discharges. A long time ago, there has been. I wouldn't know the most recent date. Okay, like a long time ago, like in this calendar year, or years and years. Okay, this is this. That's good news. That's that's very helpful. Um, though it's not related to this, but related to this, I'm very concerned about some of the gun crime that's happening at the malls, which are mm -hmm. effectively transit centers too, like Kingsway and Wem. Um, is there any commentary on that, or what? Like, what we Anything we can share with the public about that? Well, is the question that we have a gun? Oh, problem? I'm out of time. Shoot. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Maybe come Stay back. Stay by the bell. I'll come back. Come back. Come back for next round, Councillor Chance. Councillor Nack, go ahead, please. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sophie, and thank you for this information. Uh, a few questions. So I wanted to loop back in. We we had had a conversation last week at Community and Public Services about the number of enforcement officers in, in a number of areas, including uh, this space. Uh, I just want to guess, and I know, I know we couldn't talk about everything uh, in public because part of it was, was numbers we'd gotten from Calgary, but I was just wondering if you can give me a sense of where we're at today. We, we did get to talk about some, but I was hoping for a bit of a reminder of what, what we're looking at when we compare ourselves to a spot like Calgary, appreciating there aren't sort of one-to-one -one different or exact similarities, but, but uh, there are some. So I'm wondering in terms of the number of enforcement officers. Well, I can, uh, hi, Councilor Mack. Uh, I can answer that with some information that I know was published uh, in news media for Calgary, so I'm not. Yes, uh, exactly, not that's what I'm looking for, whatever's of, been published. Yeah, yeah so uh, what I read is by March of next year, uh, they will have 185 TPOs through their system, uh, and currently we have 93 TPOs in Edmonton. Okay, so we're, we'll be about half of what they're at. And do you know what they were at before this? So you're saying before by March, they're, they're looking to be at 180. Um, do you know what, what they were, like when the last increase was out of curiosity? I think they had some increases earlier this year as well. That was uh, the news following um, Calgary settling its uh, budget adjustment for next year. Um, oh. But I think they have historically been at a higher level than we have. Yeah, and I mean, there's a population difference, so so it might not be a fair comparison to be one to one. Um, but it, 
when I look at that, when I hear that discrepancies there, I don't want to talk about Calgary, but I'm curious about if you were more in line with, with what we would be seeing in spots like Calgary, how might that change what you're doing right now? I'm just trying to get a sense of, I don't want to focus on Calgary's numbers. I'm looking at Edmonton saying, what might you do differently depending on the number of people that you have? Uh, from a TPO perspective, I think yeah. uh, we could definitely increase our presence in stations, uh, especially throughout the LRT, on the LRT vehicles themselves, and also uh, get some TPOs on uh, some of our more um, problematic, perhaps, uh, bus routes, uh, something that we were hoping to do uh, this year, but we just haven't had the resources to do so. And I just don't have last week's report in front of me, but, but what would ballpark you be looking for if you were going to have that sort of ideal number not budget number but number of people how many more people would you be that was 30 something i think yeah if, if memory serves because i don't have that document open in front of me either uh, you've caught me off guard but uh, i believe there were 44 tpos mentioned in that one 44 okay which yeah. would allow for so so essentially if i was if that was that was changing if you had that you'd be looking at greater coverage uh, throughout the day, you'd be looking at actually, you know, having more folks riding certain routes uh, and and a greater sort of proactive presence in stations right now. That's, those are sort of the three areas we would be addressing if, if that was different, right? Uh, I would add to that uh, our staffing levels overnight because I know quite often we have uh, fairly low staffing for the number of folks who are uh, in stations at the end of uh, shift service and have to be asked to leave. Okay. What what do we have right now in terms of the an average night? Uh, well, I can tell you, uh, as an example, on Sunday night, uh, there were 228 people found in stations uh, at the end of service, uh, 54 of those alone in Churchill, uh, and we had 12 TPOs working the uh, the shift for uh, closing up all those stations. So and obviously, that takes a lot of time engaging with all those folks and, and getting them on their way and making sure they're connecting and, and know about the uh, the shelter shuttle. But uh, also, if anything uh, goes awry, those aren't the kind of numbers that we want to see for an officer safety standpoint. Yeah. So the, the goal would be because you're right. So what I'm understanding is the TPO at the end of the night isn't just trying to shoo out 228 people and say y'all got to go. They go in and say, hey, we, we have to exit the station, but we would like to help you get to, to resources. And so they would probably spend a decent amount of time with, with each of those 228 to try to get them somewhere. Is that right? That's correct. And, you know, other things as well, medical incidents that come up, they're administering sure. Narcan, et cetera. Yeah. I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Before I go to Councillor Stevenson, if, uh, uh, if, if you could please get that number to us, right? How many TPOs that you would be looking for? Because I am actually thinking about making a, making a motion related to, a, related to that, if you could confirm those numbers when it comes to my Just turn. Just pulling up that yeah, uh, Thank you so now. much. Okay, Councillor Stevenson, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you very much. I uh, am really grateful to all of our partners for being here today and for all the work that's ongoing. You know, I, I'm going to quote uh, Mr. Gervin back to himself, which is that, you know, what I, what I think we're, we're continuing to see is sort of the, the ceiling, the, the positive side, you know, is getting higher and higher. We've increased ridership. Crime severity is down. The number of people accepting help is, is going up. Um, but we still have that, those floors. The, the low points are still really low. Um, so I do, do just want to take, take that time, though, to acknowledge those positive aspects that, that the, 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 again, the ceiling is going up. Um, and I think what I'm really taking from this, which can feel very unsatisfying and, unfrust and frustrating, but again, it seems that we are doing the right things and we're headed in the right direction. Is that a general, general sense that, that partners would share? Absolutely, Councillor. We're, we're on the right path and we have that plan. We need to keep doing it. Yeah. And, and we so need to keep working through it. Yeah. And, and I think that it can be really hard um, 
to hold the course, mm -hmm. um, but but wondering, you know, we've just heard there are some resource priorities. So, so what can help accelerate us down that that path? So we've heard, um, you know, additional TPO resources. So look forward to the mayor uh, bringing that forward. I think we had recommendations from ETS staff around, um, you know, potentially having staff attendance um, in stations, having some of that animation. Just anything from any of the partners in terms of other other initiatives, other ways to, to again accelerate the progress that we're making. There's a couple things. One is obviously with the announcement today, we'll be expanding our tracks program over the next year, but that's going to take some time to build out mm -hmm. of police resources. Uh, the other thing in relation to the data, we're expediting some technology within our own organization for uh, mobile dispatch within our tracks members, members that are on foot. That'll give us the ability, more information at our fingertips, as well as be able to track where those members are in relation to, you know, where they're being deployed. Is that in relation to crime? So. Okay, great, great. Really appreciate that. I, I just have to add, Councillor, to that the you know continued focus on the core root problem of mental health and addictions. Mm -hmm. um, I think that more work in that would have, I think, more impact than any of the other. What I what I've referred to before as you know addressing the symptoms of that. So absolutely, and I mean I think I think that's that's what strikes me is um, you know given given some recent events like. I think we could have the most perfect transit safety system in the world and, and um, without some of the external factors being addressed, the, those are hard to, to prevent, right? Yeah, and, and failing that, I, I do think the more presence we have, mm -hmm. whether it's police or TPOs, that, that has a significant impact. That, that has really helped us to get where, we, where, where we've got. Remember, two years ago, we had 52 TPOs and... Uh, the fact that we've got EPS dedicated to transit, mm -hmm. we've got, uh, we're up to 93 TPOs has had, I think, the biggest impact. Uh, not, n and of course, with our, all of our partners like Bentero as well, that, that's where we're having success. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think um, you know, some of the, the programs we considered in terms of, again, having, having other forms of presence as well. So, so certainly enforcement, TPOs, police officers, I think agree, they have such a profoundly uh, important impact. And looking at some of those other factors as well, staff just being around um, and some of that, that animation as well. Okay, so that's, I think those are all my questions actually. Again, just really grateful for the work. Um, it's, it's so important, um, but again, it, it feels, it's hard, it's, I, I, I want us to be farther and faster all the time, but it is encouraging to see uh, the direction um, being the right one and that we're starting to see return on that. So thank you. If, if I could just add one thing, Councillor, if you don't mind, it's just like, because I, I know some people equate police and TPOs to enforcement only, but I, I just think it's really important to, to say how much non-enforcement activities the police and TPOs do. Uh, they're, they're the ones helping with the navigation initially quite often. They're the ones taking people to get their IDs. They're the ones who are doing some of that navigation. Enforcement is actually the last thing they do and the last resort. So I just, I think it's important to, to understand that. Thanks. Absolutely, appreciate that clarification and uh, appreciate the, the holistic way that all the teams are approaching it. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Gartmel. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, thanks to everyone for the conversation today. I, um, first of all, I want to maybe just warn my colleagues. I want to, uh, I gave notice of motion on a fair gate motion uh, to be presented later today. Uh, I'm going to bring that forward either in response to this report or as a subsequent, just because the conversations overlap greatly and we can just cover that all at once just from a, what I think is a pragmatic agenda management thing. So however that coordinates with your motion, Mayor Sohi and all of that, I'm, I'm not stuck on any of that, but just thought we should talk about it all at once. Just trying to follow some of the numbers and some of the conversation here. Uh, so my understanding is that there's six constables on at any one time. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. And that's when it's uh, six positions, but um, you know, give or take vacation sickness, but one and six. Most of the time there's six people. Are they in cars traveling to calls at stations or are they on the system? Uh, we want them on the system. Uh, as well as, uh, you know, there's court, there's other, uh, a lot of times too with our tracks, uh, especially with the, uh, uh, any react uh, impromptu rallies, protests, sometimes they are 
uh, removed from their uh, from their current duties in order to address uh, emergent issues in other areas of the city. But again, the majority of time, that's their mandate that we want them to be as which is on the platforms. Yeah, okay. So in ordinary time, they're on the system. So um, this is a bit of a long question, and I apologize for that. I, too, appreciate the story that was shared and the recording that was shared. Um, I, too, have a story to share. The first person I spoke to this morning in my office was a person that works in my office. Uh, it's a young woman in her, in her 20s, and she had to, she takes the LRT from South Campus to downtown. And uh, she got to Churchill Station and had to push her way off the train today, past three people that were clearly under the influence of drugs. Uh, so she's scared. I gotta find a way to get her home at the end of the day. Uh, and she's not riding that train again, and I'm not gonna ask her to. Now, I don't know where that shows up in your statistics, but chances are that when we tell this story and, and that things are getting better, that it's all going to be okay, these are my words, I know I'm being a little glib, that we're on the right path, we have the right plan, it's just going to take time. Effectively, we're asking people, like the person that works for me, to just keep taking the hits, keep using the system, keep taking that risk, because eventually it'll get better. How are we going to make it feel safe for people? Because these, the, these stories, the stories that are filling up my inbox, the first email I got this morning is talks about the Nate platform, seven people all consuming meth, a cloud of meth, needles all over the place, no place for students to stand, students scared to get off the train and get to class. Those aren't showing up in your statistics, those things are not being reported. People just want to get past it and get on. So the, the statistics, the presentation tells one story, the constant flow of feedback, almost 100% that I get, tells a completely contrary story. How do we square this circle? I'm, I'm just going to jump in on this one, Councillor. I think it's more presence. Like things, th those things that you described usually don't happen when there's a police officer on the platform, when there's a TPO on the platform. Um, and, and what we've been able to do with our resources is get as much presence as we can. But I think if you want to completely eliminate those kinds of incidents, it, it's going to be sort of 24 and 7 on the platform, on the trains. Um, and, and I think you're talking about hundreds of more resources to provide that kind of a presence on the system. But that's, that's the one thing I think that will change drastically. Yeah. So I did hear, um, Mr. Ma I'm sorry, Mr. McIntyre, I don't know your rank. I really apologize. I'm not feeling well. But I heard you say something to the effect of there's a lot of crossover and a lot of encounter with people that do not pay fares. So is it your view that if we had some form of fair gate, some, something that compelled people to pay a fare uh, to at least get to the place where they get on the train, that that would be a benefit. And I don't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah, I mean, access control, uh, councillor, I mean, that, that's a city decision. Uh, but to just, I know it's been stated before, but, you know, you have current, the current environment, current strategies, current policies, you know, a lot of, it's, it makes it easy for people to use those spaces for illegitimate purposes. Yeah. I see, I've been in this position only for maybe a couple and a half months now, almost three months. It's, it's very similar to where we see with our encampments. We make it easy for people to use spaces for illegitimate and illegal purposes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wright. Thank you. Um, how many access points do we have across our LRT system? Councillor, we'd have to get back to you with that one, unless somebody from transit can help me out here. I yeah, have no idea. I can jump in, Dwayne. It's Carrie. Thank you, uh, we Carrie. have hundreds upon hundreds. So there's 43 uh, total stations across transit. Uh, so our transit uh, centers and LRT stations. And then within those spaces, there's multiple different uh, entry points. So different doorways, stairwells, 
Okay. Yes. Okay. But 40, sure. 43 stations. Okay. okay. All up 43 is what we have. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and then I'm just wondering, so you've indicated Edmonton's got 93 transit officers, Calgary funded for 180. How many, how many, do we know how many dedicated um, Calgary police are, are dedicated to transit? Because I think we've got 21, right? Yeah, I don't have the numbers from our Calgary counterparts, unfortunately. We have, uh, I'm going to say 24 right now, actually, and with the potential or ideally having 50 uh, by November of 2024. Okay, um, but, but does Calgary have dedicated transit police? Unfortunately, I'm not sure. Okay. Mr. I can Hunter? add not on the policing aspect, but that the motion or the uh, funding that was provided by the provincial government in the spring was for both 50 officers for the police service and the Calgary police. And that service. was, they were all supposed to be dedicated to transit? That, that is what was provided for funding. I don't know where they are with the deployment, but that was what was provided in the news. Oh, we've, we've got the funding or we just got the news? I believe we're awaiting a funding announcement, potentially even today. Okay, uh, to was that the two o'clock? To speak specifically to Kay. that uh, 50 officers here in Edmonton. Okay. I, unfortunately, I don't have Kay. the answer to that. And, and then I understand there, I mean, there is a shortfall. There's a vacancy of like 96 officers with the police service right now. So where are we getting those from in order to get the 50 officers? Yeah, I can't speak to all our, our vacancies that we hold Kay. right now, but as... Uh, recruit classes graduate and come out and as those vacancies are backfilled in the priority areas where they're needed in patrol and other areas like that uh, any excess are moved into areas like our tracks teams and we slowly begin to supplement them with recruits going back uh, to patrol okay well maybe, maybe I'll, I'll ask that tomorrow morning when we when we do the the other one um, and I'll focus try to focus here on the transit um, Sorry, okay, and I, I'm just thinking like, you know, duplication and overlap. Um, do we need to have um, a TPO and a, a, a police officer together? Can they not maybe one work the day shift, one work the night shift? I don't know. Yeah, we don't deploy our resources together. So they're not paired together. They're deployed separately. Okay. Uh, they do work in close conjunction with each other and have contact but they're not deployed as a pairing, as you put it. It's not, it's not, I think the help team is the one that has Correct. the pairing together and everything, yeah, okay. They are not co-deployed. Okay, and then I'm just with the cot booth. Um, so Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, it looks like from this, um, the pie chart that was provided here on slide number, I forget which one it is. Um, the majority of those services seem to be going, or the, what you're providing, like AHS, shelter, health, um, you talked about the, the ID and that from Alberta Supports. Does the province fund any of this work? Because those all seem to be provincial responsibilities. I don't understand your question, sorry, Councillor. Well, well if, if we're providing funding to Bantero and to, I, I'm guessing TPOs, I, I'm not sure who all makes up the COT team. Um, but the city's providing it to direct people to provincial services. Is that exactly. right, Robbie? Yeah. yeah. So do we get any funding from the province for this? The CAW teams are funded by the city. Okay, to direct people to provincial services. Okay, um, that's all. My time is up. I'll come back for second round. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Prince. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question about slide 10. So I see in 2023, only 9.5% of vulnerable individuals who were using transit spaces as shelter, is that correct? Did not uh, want to go to emergency shelter. Is that my understanding? No, 9.5% accepted the emergency shelter support. Right, nine point, no sorry, 9.5% accepted, but were they like uh, within transit spaces? 
Is that yeah. correct? Yes, they were. Okay. So, and then only 10% embraced long-term housing support, meaning what does embraced? I mean, they took assistance in getting to long-term housing or began okay. the journey towards long-term housing. Okay, so this is where my concern is, and I understand that I heard you say that some of the reasoning is that they don't feel safe going, which is parallel to how transit users are feeling too. I, you see, like, there's a lot of unsafe feelings going around, in, not only for the transit users, but also for the vulnerable people. And I think, as um, uh, Mr. Corbold was saying, you know, maybe we're looking, needing to address mental health and uh, addictions to, I, I'm guessing, to address this. Is, is that your take? How would we, how, how, what do we need to do to see an increase in people accepting shelter and housing? Yeah, I think, Councillor, it's the quality of the housing. It's things like our minimum shelter standards. It's, uh, and those are all things that will contribute, I think, to a, a change in culture in terms of people wanting to accept those those things. And I think there's some work on that being done, but it, you know, it's been slow, but we are seeing now, you know, an RFP has gone out for indigenous shelters and an RFP has gone out for a, a woman's shelter. So, so yeah, I just think we need to get those barriers down in the shelter and the housing system and um, to, to change that perception and that reality sometimes that, that shelters are not safe places for people to go. And I understand that, but I think it's the housing support that really shocked me the most because I cannot imagine that there's any uh, housing support that we could provide that is worse than using transit space as a primary form of shelter. Yeah, I would agree, which is why we've been really careful over the last two years to, to make sure we're we're closing down those spaces at night when we when they're not being used for transit so that people can't s spend the night in those unsafe places. I mean, there's no hygiene, there's no bathrooms, there's no, right. uh, I'm all constantly worried about people getting hurt. Um, so that's why we're, we've been so, um, I, I would say aggressive on not allowing those spaces to be used after the transit system has, has uh, closed. So my concern or my thought is it's not necessarily the actual housing that's the problem or, or the, the concern. Maybe it's more the mental health concerns of the individuals. Well, I think Could every be. individual is going to be different. And, and so I think it's, I don't think we can categorize the specific issue. I think, um, and, and like was mentioned by the team, some sometimes it takes multiple attempts to get people comfortable to go into the system because of whatever state of mind they're in or whatever might be influencing them. And so, like, it's, it's just not a black and white decision, I think. No. Uh, so I think it's no. just very complicated in terms of what, what may or may yeah, not. Yeah, I was just surprised at the low uh, percentage that, that's concerning to me. Uh, and I did want to ask uh, quickly about um, Northgate Transit Centre. Uh, recently, have we done, have we started any... Uh, new safety measures there, Dwayne, Mr. Hunter, do you know? I don't have any information about Northgate specifically. However, uh, David, anything on that? Yeah, we've added Northgate to one of our focus areas for the transit peace officers. And I know that, um, uh, I won't speak for the EPS, but I know that the, the divisional resources have been working in there as well, uh, as well as some of our... Um, resources from social development and uh, I know uh, just keeping an eye on that uh, and, and the way that the public washroom is used and a number of other issues that were brought up from uh, the surrounding uh, community there. Yeah, and I would just like to take a couple seconds to say thank you very much to administration, uh, ELT and uh, EPS for discussions in that area. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Principal. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, I would like to start to thank his, all the integrated efforts uh, from different team and for this presentation. So my first question is about ridership. 
Uh, the ridership based on the data provided right now, and because this is by monthly uh, ridership, and I did simple math and just on average per weekly. So in November, it seems is lower than uh, October. Does that mean does that mean our ridership is decreasing? So based on the data provided, just a very simple math. Uh, math. Uh, no, counselor. So we have seasonal variations and we don't have a full month yet for November. The team is actually processing it right now and I'm expecting it to go up. Um, so that was just preliminary for the first three weeks in November at that point in time when they ran the report of what it looked like. I understand that. And then for the October, we have full, full week and by average per week and is one point one point one point three million million people and then and based on the member three weeks and per week divided by three is 1.1. 1 .1. So that demonstrates land days. I don't know if we can catch up that variances. So I, ju I just want to put the information there. This data demonstrates to me the readership is actually decreased, is not increased. No, uh, every month is different in terms okay. of the ridership patterns, just for clarity. Uh, it's not the same amount of ridership every single month of the year. Yeah. It varies. Okay, so we will see that next month. Um, so for the perception of safety, do we have the last reports? What is per, uh, percentage of safety perception? Do we have that data? I don't have that in front of me, but I can get that pulled. So I just try to do this some comparison and between these two data. So why I'm asking that a question, the purpose is no matter is monthly updates or bi-monthly updates, we want to provide the information to the public to see uh, what is the city doing, take all those efforts to improve public transit is working or what is not working. Can I get sense or get some information to say, and based on those reports, updates provided started in May back to this year, is there any specific things we can identify is now working, we could change do things differently, or is something is really working well? Councillor, could you clarify if you mean with respect to safety in general or just perception of safety uh, or, ever, or everything? Safety in general. And because what I can say, and from every time the reports, yes, city put lots of effort and we work on the different angle to uh, try to improve public safety. And the, but the data right now, how we measure that progress and can you provide more information and in updates to say, yes, yeah, this is working and we should continue doing more. Or oh, okay, this is not working. What is a way we could do differently? I think I'd rather to say that type of updates come out and instead of say, oh, this is a number. And because number um, depends on how we interpret. Good point, Councillor, and I can bring it up. Uh, we try to do our presentation with respect to the enhanced transit safety plan. So the four pillars of work, safety, perception of safety, well-being and integration. So the integration is we have to do this work together and you can see that we're doing it, that's working. If I direct you to slide seven with respect to safety, it's provided by the EPS data. The nonviolent criminal incidents from 2023 to 2022, you see they directly and they increase quite a bit. That's because of the proactive work by introducing the police to the system and executing warrants for arrest. That and all the proactive work with the TPOs has resulted in that dip down in 75 violent incidents. So it is working. Uh, that is the safety bucket that we talked about, the perception of safety. We've mentioned the enhanced cleaning that we're doing with the cleaning grant, the changes to the stations uh, so and I so my time is out and I may come back uh, to clarify something. 
and Thank I'll finish you. off well being. You want to quickly finish your thought? Sorry. You want to quickly and then finish? I was just going to explain, sir, that it's well being. We're trying to figure that out as much as possible, and we did that with the research. How can we change a person's perception or their well mm. feeling of well being within transit spaces? And that's what Dr. Sarah Schulman was here to uh, help us present. Uh, Councillor Paquette, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you. You know, the the impact of violence is so personal and traumatizing, so we can talk about numbers, and I appreciate the the trend uh, that we are seeing in the in the improvement. Uh, but you know what, Councillor Cartmel's staff experienced, what that women experienced at uh, at the uh, at the Coliseum station, uh, you know, so horrifying that two 12-year-olds we are who are alleged to commit that crime. It's just, it's just, it's just a terrifying situation, right? But I do want to acknowledge, I do want to acknowledge that we are seeing overall a positive trend in, in safety. So well, I want to focus on accelerating that, right? What can we do to accelerate? One of the issues identified, obviously, the best way would be to get province on board, federal government on board, invest in housing, invest in mental health, invest in shelters, and invest in detox facilities. We can do advocacy on that. So Andre, my question to you is, what more we can do to convince those two orders of government to invest in core causes of what are we seeing on the LRD system and the bus, the bus system? Well, I think it gets back to data data again, Mayor. Yeah. I mean, that that was what I think helped us with the shelter spaces and just confirming the data. So I think yeah. uh, talking about some of the data we have today, some of the experiences and and how they're related to core, core um, issues. Um, and then I think in the meantime, like I've said before, it's I, I think increased presence of, of EPS and TPOs does, does prevent and give people a better sense of safety uh, because very very little bad happens when there's police and TPOs on the platform is, a, is yeah, our experience. Absolutely, I want to come to that. Right? Why I want to understand what is what is in our control that we can do more of, which we have been doing. We increased uh, TPOs from 50 to 93. I'm very appreciative that EPS has allocated 20 to uh, police officers that are dedicated to uh, 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 LRT, I understand another 50 will be added by November 2024, or total will go to 50? 50. 50 total, sir. 50 total. So, you know, uh, so that is happening. So what is in our control? I want to understand better because I want to move forward some proposals for our council to consider on uh, adding more TPOs, maybe working with, maybe we need to add more uh, uh, caught teams or social workers. I just want, I don't have something planned. I mean, I don't have any wording, but I just, maybe I'll work with clerk during the break to, I just want to understand what we can do to accelerate, but that is in our control. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is to go back to the funded package that we presented at the beginning of this budget cycle. And, uh, you know, we appreciate council funded 50% of that, but I think fund the second 50% would help. Yeah. Um, and then, that w with you know more caught teams, more help teams, those are all working, and I you know I agree that um, that's not everybody's experience, but that's because we can't be there twenty four and seven in all of the stations and platforms. So, again, the more the so, more presence we have, the the more impact we're going to have. So I because I'm I'm interested in real solutions, right? Uh, so would based on the data that you presented to us, based on the results that you have seen. Adding more TPOs, adding more COD teams uh, would help. I believe so, and the reason why is the things that are happening that are bad are happening when those people are not are not present. Okay, got it. Uh, to EPS, I really want to understand. I think there are. I know you have vacancies. I know you have so much other pressure. I deeply appreciate the work that officers are doing. Uh, you know. Coming out of COVID, this has been such a devastating impact of COVID on, on our uh, fabric of our communities. Uh, out of nine, I think you have 1,980 total frontline police officers, and having 50 
dedicated to system that is under so much scrutiny, uh, even having 22 now, right? What, what, is, what can you do in the interim to allocate more resources? So I, I think I can jump in on that. So one of the things we're looking at is how are we deploying our resources as community safety teams? Mm -hmm. So being a little more agnostic, getting into those neighborhoods that are affected by these crimes. The reality is, is that we can probably deploy 50 police officers into the transit system. Your communities around those transit systems are going to be impacted and those police officers will be pulled off into those communities yeah. as needed. That's, so yeah. I think, Mr. Mayor, the answer really is, is we'll do the best we can, but I think we have to look holistically at the transit system and those neighborhoods around it. And, you know, when we talk about the peace officers, we talk about working with our partners, understanding what are their authorities, where can they step in mm -hmm. where we don't need to be there. Yeah, okay. And you asked the question, the things you could look at doing, those are some of the answers, I think. Okay, got it. I, I might have another round, but thank you so much for those answers. Okay, uh, sure. I will move the, oh, sorry, I'll move the second round. Oh. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, moved by Mayor Sohi and seconded by Councillor Tang. Please vote. We have 11 votes. Please display the vote. And that is carried. And back to you, Mr. Mayor, like a hot potato. Oh, thank you so much. And you are next then. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so I just want to be clear because I, I need to talk to my residents who are emailing me about this all the time. Uh, how many How many officers? 20 or, or not just officers, but supervisors, 22 in total? Yes. Tw uh, <clears throat> 22. Yeah, we have three teams right now of uh, six constables and one sergeant, so. So, 21. 21. Okay, and and I just want to be clear with my residents, this is the best that we can do. Right now, yes, it is. Okay. I will be delivering that message. All right, um, so further to, uh, um, maybe adjacent to what, uh, uh, we've been talking about is um, as we get this presence, what we see is that incidents are moving outward from the downtown, uh, usually uh, along main streets or along uh, transit. So I can say for a fact that uh, uh, residents in my ward along the rail in Belvedere and Clareview are a little bit worried. I know we've been doing a lot of work in Clareview. Um, are we going to be getting more presence in the Belvedere area, where we already have uh, very much documented incidents. Well, uh, to answer that, you know, hopefully by the end of 2024, we do have our six teams. You know, four will be one supervisor, seven constables, and uh, two supervisors, eight constables for a total of 50. Uh, okay. But it's important to note that, A, we want to deploy them, you know, uh, throughout throughout the network, but as well as it's, I, we do not want them specifically on the platform when we have that amount of coverage as well, as that we do know that, uh, as the deputy said, that uh, that it will affect the neighborhoods around uh, the transit stations, but that will allow us to go outside uh, the uh, the transit property in order to in order to uh, address some of those issues. Yeah. Southgate is a good example. I was not present at that town hall that took place, but uh, that's one of the uh, one of the opportunities that we see in the future as well. Because Southgate is a very busy terminal. You have uh, Ainley School is there, the the shopping center is there, and then you have Malmo Plains, which is right across the street. Yeah. So it's important that the members uh, uh, go out uh, a little bit more. And remember, it's not just the trains as well. You also have your other, well, the LRT is being built. Uh, Jasper, uh, Jasper Place Transit is a busy place. Yeah, I get uh, it. Kingsway, busy place. Um, That's a good answer. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, all right. So the next question, I guess, is in these interventions, um, I'm assuming that there are also tickets being given out for, uh, you know, under the bylaw. Am I correct in that? And are these tickets generally going to people with no fixed address? Can we, is, is that fair to say? Because that, uh, that has been the trend and it probably has not changed, I would guess. Can anyone speak to that? From, a, from the EPS perspective, uh, 
you know, a part of them, we call it the part two ticket. Uh, uh, those ones, you know, the members have a lot of discretion on that area as part of, uh, you know, coming across a, a, a vulnerable individual. Uh, we're not going to be there. There's no purpose to give the ticket to that. Uh, it's, we like to educate to compliance and then enforce only when necessary is, is the mission that we normally dictate to the members out there. Right. Okay. Well, I, is there a number that we can quote? That's something we'll have to get that data for you, Councillor. Okay. And uh, of these interventions, if we break it down to demographic, I would assume that the majority are Indigenous. Is that fair to say? And that's the data that we don't have with us here today, Councillor. Well, the majority of our homeless are Indigenous, and it's generally those folks who are seeking warm places. So I think, logically, wouldn't we assume that? I mean, I, I'm not asking a trick question. Yeah, I don't. I don't know necessarily if we just target someone seeking a warm I didn't place say target. for. Uh, and sorry, I, I'm putting words in your mouth, but I, I don't think we would necessarily uh -huh. um, seek to seek enforcement on someone who's uh, I simply we're seeking doing a, a I'm warm just saying place. based on numbers alone, based on the fact that we have these ratios, that the ratio would probably generally hold, wouldn't it? Would it not? Yeah, I can't, sorry, I can't Well, I can. Clear. We already have this data. I'm asking almost a rhetorical question because we know this. So thank I guess I'm out of time. Thank, thank you. you, Councillor Piquet. Councillor Salvador? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, really hearing a desire to accelerate the adoption of, of known solutions, um, both on the systemic side, but also thinking about immediate actions and um, appreciate the underscoring of visibility and presence. So I, I'm just gonna stick with that for, for another minute here. Um, so understanding that there is gonna be an expansion of the tracks program beyond the current 21 officers. It's just, it's unclear to me why that's gonna take, you know, a year to get up and going and can you help me understand that? Yeah, so it's essentially, like I explained previously, uh, when we have these vacancies open, our priority to fill them would first be in the frontline police officers in patrol. So if someone leaves the Edmonton Police Service and retires, uh, for example, and we have a recruit class coming out, um, that recruit class needs to backfill that position first wherever um, it originated from, which is ultimately ends up being patrol. Once we can staff those completely, any excess recruit allocations that we would have uh, can go to putting them towards areas like tracks where we have okay. s vacant spaces to put members. So okay, okay, and maybe just to pause on that piece, and I'm just aware of my time as well. Um, why is it? Why is it that the excess are going to tracks? Like if that. So I can, if, if the question is excess necessarily, the real, the, like what we deal with here is we staff our frontline patrol policing first, right? Those are the right. priority vacancies for us. So we go through a priority vacancy exercise where all vacancies are assessed equally, um, but there are priorities within the organization where we do need minimum staffing standards within patrol, within other specialized areas. We try to fill those up first. Okay, and where, and then just to the prioritization piece, I assume transit, is pretty high on that priority list. It's high with everything else there, correct. And then we have multiple priorities, we have multiple demands right, and right. opportunities we have to fill, so. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and then just to further understand even temporary reallocations towards, it, regardless of the, um, the additional increase to the 50, um, am I understanding correctly that you'd be pulling folks from the adjacent neighborhoods around the stations? Our goal within this bureau will be to start to try to become a little more, let's call it generalizing with our deployments. And we kind of treat communities as a whole as having impacts or having demands. So when we look at transit, it's not just riding the rails or riding the bus lines. It's those communities that may be seeing displacement of crime into them that we have to respond to. So I'm not saying we're gonna pull people from there, but we're gonna look at how we're deploying these teams to be a little more, um, I don't know, agnostic in terms of how they're 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 dealing with those problems so okay okay that's helpful um and then i also just wanted to switch gears a little bit uh really appreciated the stories that we heard today during the presentation um around uh the prototyping that's happening with oracle nosy fest um the the 175 stories that were gathered i mean i imagine that's incredibly rich 
qualitative data? Um, how do we make sure that we are honoring those stories and, and honoring them through action going forward? Um, that seems to be a bit of a missing piece. I'm just unclear on, on that. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. I think there's three routes forward uh, with Oracle. One is continuing to build on what we've learned around activating space. And another route to safety is you know, fostering a culture of connection and care. Um, and you've got lots of local Edmontonians who are resources, not just peace officers and, and security folks, but um, everyday citizens who wanna be part of it. And so how do we continue to um, activate space? A second is to go deeper into the data itself. We've got uh, a dashboard that's visual. We've got these 175 stories. They do show a plurality of experiences, not just one single story. And I think it wor it's worth all of us um, getting to spend time learning about that. And the third is really to start to segment the stories. There are stories about the role that bus drivers play in um, shaping people's day-to-day -day experiences. There are stories about how peace officers can shape people's well-being for better or worse. And there's tons of stories, again, about how everyday folks are part of the solution. And so beginning to segment those stories and use those um, to host some different kinds of dialogues and conversations and use the stories as part of education and, and um, yeah, a change of, of the culture around transit. That's, that's really helpful and I appreciate sort of the three, three distinct buckets and pathways forward. Um, you know, maybe just back to, to administration. I know there were some uh, previous conversations around um, space activations within transit centers themselves, um, but I'm, I'm also interested in how we can dive deeper into the data, how we can start to segment those stories um, and really, really incorporate uh, the value that this qualitative work is bringing to the transit safety conversation. And I'm out of time, I'm so sorry. I will have to come back. Thank you, Constance Salvador, Constance Tang. Great, thank you very much. And maybe I'll just continue from there. Um, well-being certainly is very much part of our transit safety plan. I feel like that threat has really been lost today. So thank you for bringing that back, Dwayne. Um, 175 stories, 600 Edmontonians. I understand there, it's not just all transit users or some non-transit users. Was it all feel-good stories, like it's perceived to be? Like, you know, are there stories of fear and violence? I think I, I, I recall reading a few when I came out to your share back. There are, so of the 175 stories, uh, we ask people about the tonality of their stories. So one of the differences with Oracle is people get to interpret their own stories. Um, and it trended across the entire spectrum. So uh, we have stories that are emotionally charged around fear uh, and discomfort and all the way to awe and wonder. Um, it trended more positive than negative, but we certainly have stories that, that fill the full continuum. Mm -hmm. um, and you have outlined a few few options, and, and I recall uh, you had um, a diagram that kind of outlined a little bit of analysis of these stories. Um, I remember there was a triangle about kind of potentially, you know, what are the themes that we're really looking at? Can you talk a little bit about those three pieces? Sure, so um, on the visual dashboard, which is available to everyone, you can start to see some of the aggregated data. And again, folks interpreted their stories. We asked them to share a moment that mattered to them in and around transit, and then to tell us what shaped that moment. Um, and so you're referring to a triangle with three uh, triads, three parts to the triangle. Um, infrastructure was on one side, culture, um, and behavior of other transit riders. Um, and what folks said mostly shapes their experience for better and worse on transit is the culture and interpersonal behavior. Um, and that infrastructure, while important for getting around, actually isn't the thing that is transformative for their today-to-day -to -day experiences. And so then looking at, well, what are the levers for changing culture? How do we create a culture of empathy and care um, and sometimes when we're just focused on stories of safety, we perpetuate a culture of fear and discomfort. What are ways to balance that mm -hmm. out? And so the, that's what a lot of our conversations were about. And I think we, we actually perpetuated that today. Um, and I think it's interesting to kind of see where a lot of this data, where the research is telling us. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the role of the local listeners. So these are, are they professionals? Are they like, did you just find people off the streets? Um, you know, what kind of, you know, how, how did they, like, how do, I think this question, how do everyday people play a role? 
Yeah, so we had eight local listeners this year. They were recruited uh, off of trains and buses uh, and uh, on Instagram. They're really everyday folks, everything from uh, stay-at-home parents to chaplains to folks that work uh, you know, as short-order cooks. Um, and these were just folks that really wanted to listen. Um, and that was one of the resounding pieces of feedback we got um, from folks that shared their stories is just what a cathartic experience it is for somebody to listen to them. Most of our interactions were 30 to 45 minutes in length, so a long time to actually get to hear people's stories. Um, and yeah, these are folks that really would like to be part of the solution. And can you talk a little bit about this element of, say, placemaking um, and activation? Because, sure, we have an interview with someone for 30 minutes and you collect the stories and that's kind of the end of that. Um, are there other secondary impact that, that, that resulted? Because I, when I participated um, at Churchill Square, you know, it felt very vibrant. There's a lot of activity. There's a lot of interactions with, between professionals and a vulnerable population, for example, uh, interactions that would not happen under any other circumstance. Yeah, well, one of the goals of Oracle is to test some creative and novel ways to get people to talk to each other and to cross lines of difference. So whether that's offering free watermelon or hot chocolate or uh, playing a game about well-being uh, or being able to um, you know, spend a moment drawing something, really trying to, to create an experience in space that's a little bit delightful and joyful um, and not your typical extractive experience of answering a survey. Um, so the way in which we collect data can also have a profound impact on the results of that data. Um, and that's partly what we um, are trying to show through Oracle. Did anybody comment on, through this exercise, how it made them feel in terms of perception of safety? Yes, lots. Um, and in fact, at Nosy Fest, which is where we uh, turned the data back over to community to help us make sense of it, um, that was the most of the feedback that we received. We had a graffiti wall where people could legally write graffiti um, and tell us what they thought. Um, and most people talked about how humanizing it was um, and, yeah, the effect of getting to meet a stranger. And maybe you felt fearful or uncomfortable about somebody that looked different from you, but you shared a story with them um, and you got to cross that line of difference for a moment. So is the project over or is there a sort of a, a, a pathway or continuation of this? I'll jump in there. So where we take it from here is we get a final report and it will provide as we do. It, it will as we always do. It'll give us the opportunities where the gaps are. So now, and then what we'll do is see what we can actually do. What uh, if we can continue the work, if there is funding to continue the work and what that work looks like. Yes, we're more than interested in doing it for sure. I appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Cartmel. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Um, I guess I have a question for you, sir, about process. Do you want me to put my motion on the floor at this point, or do you want to wait? And there's only 10 minutes left before the break, so. Well, let's get through the questions first, right? And okay. uh, then we can, uh, when we can look at, because uh, I also have, a, uh, by the way, there'll be sub, I, I also have a motion, right? So I think we'll figure that out once, uh, during the break, maybe we can talk to Clerk, how to okay. navigate that here. Okay. okay, well, so just a few more questions then. So there was a comment earlier that when people are uh, present in the station that uh, they know when the police arrive, or they know when the police are there. Uh, do you remember that, making that comment a moment ago? Uh, yes, Councillor. And so it sounds like there's a bit of an effect there that when the police are present in that space, then people know there's less disorder, there's less um, occurrences, less activity, less disorderly activity. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's a social presence is the term we would use. Do the TPOs have the same effect, do you know? Like, is, it, is your observation with just the uh, sworn police officers, the EPS officers, or is when the TPOs are present, is the same sort of diminishing of activity happening? We've actually had incidents where we know, and maybe uh, Director Hunter can speak to this a little more, where we've had TPOs being swarmed or attacked within those spaces. It's not as prevalent with us, obviously. I, I, if I could take a stab at that, uh, Councillor, I, I think you have varying degrees. I, I think people, some, I would say some of uh, the folks who can differentiate between a TPO and police officer for sure, um, and different people will, will have sort of different reactions to, to that presence. But yeah, I mean, I think there's a hierarchy of presence, and if a police person is there, there's absolutely less going to happen than compared to a TPO, and then 
Same with the difference between a TPO and a, and a security guard. Well, yeah, the, like the argument's being offered that if there's more presence, we'll see less trouble. But it sounds like if there's more police presence, there's more certainty than if there's just more TPO presence. That more TPO presence might not actually have that same muting effect on disorderly conduct. I, I personally believe it would have the, uh, the effect. I, I, and I, I think it's the right balance of TPOs and police. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm not quite sure that's what I'm hearing. But um, then I want to speak uh, just another couple questions on the presentations that were made and statistics and number of complaints and those kinds of things. Um, is there a possibility that we're getting fatigue, that people that are encountering these issues on, on the system are just getting tired of reporting? And so we're getting numbers going down because people are just tired of it and they're just, they just have stopped reporting or there's less people on the system. From what I've seen in the work that I've done with EPS, uh, specifically Superintendent McIntyre, and he can jump in as well here, is we haven't seen a deflection in the reporting to suggest that there's reporting apathy, for lack of a better yeah. term. I believe that people are still continuing to report. We're seeing people use uh, the transit security things, such as Transit Watch, and people are calling in and doing those things. I don't think we've hit that point, but is he still with us? He isn't today. I, I'm sure that... Uh, you would echo that. We've talked about that in the past, Councillor. Okay, thank you. And I, I, um, I will admit I don't know a, as much as maybe I ought about the storytelling piece that we were hearing a little bit about. I guess I'm wondering if there's been an equal effort made to listen to people that have tried transit and, and refused to come back or, or have clearly, very clearly stated that they're not going to ride the system. Oracle could certainly be used for that. In this round, we spent our time in and around transit stations. So we were um, sampling folks that either were spending time in transit or using transit. I can add to that. We do, uh, Councillor, to your point, uh, we do through our rider research program, the ongoing monthly research that we do. Uh, we have a whole stream dedicated to people who no longer use transit. Uh, and we dig into that in terms of what would help them uh, and just to share their findings with us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Cons sorry, Councillor Cardinal. Councillor Wright, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, just in regards to that oracle, did, did you say you had eight local listeners? That's correct. Out of a hundred and some odd recordings, only eight people listened to them? So yeah, we had eight local listeners who on average listen to about 20 stories each over the course of three months. And we have over 5 million riders a month. What sort of impact does this have on the whole ridership? It could have lots more. This was a prototype. So um, our goal was to test the way in which local listeners can be an intervention in and around transit to strengthen well-being. So that's we were here to learn about the role that they could play going forward. Oh. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure I was hearing correctly. Um, no, I, um, I, I do have some other questions in regards to the, the, um, the root causes. Um, so I, I think Councillor Tang actually asked about the FCSS funding. Did you get a, was it five million or something that? Yeah, I think uh, Jen has an answer on that. Go ahead. Yeah, the government of Alberta increased the funding by 4.5%. Uh, what that meant then is that uh, the Ed city of Edmonton over three years got 2.75 million between 2023 and 2025. So you split that out across three years. Two million over three years, so less than a million dollars more a year. Correct. Okay. Um, how would that help some of our partners um, that, that do receive FCSS funding? Would it help to address any of the mental health or housing or addiction concerns? Our team would have looked at our current uh, number of recipients and the other um, groups that didn't receive funding and augment as required. Uh, so that we, we sprinkled the rest of that money uh, to the recipients. Okay, so just sprinkling, okay. Um, yeah, no, I. I don't, I'm not going to belabor the point. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor. Right, Councillor Jans. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry if this is pedantic. I just want to be very clear on it. In Global News yesterday, Superintendent Keith Johnson says he oversees three teams of one sergeant and three constable. My math is three times four is 12. And then today I heard 21 or 18. Yeah, that uh, quote was uh, inaccurate uh, from the media. It is one in six. I did read in Global it was one in three, but that's not what I said. Oh, sorry. So could you clarify what is the actual number? One supervisor. One supervisor. Six constables. Seven. Times three. 21. Yes. Right. Okay. So just to make things a little more confusing, Chief McPhee just did a press conference and said, quote, I think the biggest change we've seen is in transit. We're putting 50 officers in there, and we've seen a significant drop in crime level ever since we've been there. It's 50 positions by the end of 2024, and I believe one of his, uh, I did read one of his uh, statements that uh, uh, that it will take time for us to deploy, as Deputy Dreichel has stated earlier. So it's 50 going forward, not 50 now. Correct. Okay, okay, so that'll bring by us up to- By the end of 2024. 71. Nope, 50 total. Total 50, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I guess um, I appreciate there's many demands on the, on the, the time of the police. Um, what are the most dangerous or the priority areas of the city? Like, where does transit rank? Is it top 10? Are you asking, like, within our portfolios, what are the more dangerous portfolios? Or Because I, I hear sometimes, like, well, resources are being triaged to another area that's more pressing. And I'm wondering what those areas are. Well, it, it's by the moment assessment, right? Like, if we have, for instance, a protest or something that crops up and we have to respond to it, we redeploy acting and working resources into those kind of operations. Um, we try to take a real kind of data-driven model. We look at the neighborhoods where there's crime occurring and deploy properly around that. Um, but in terms of crime severity, what are the biggest impacts, which neighbourhoods? I can't tell you that right now. I don't have that in front of me. Right. So so that's a, a game time decision every day for patrol? Or is it like we, because I know we have the White Ave beat. That's certain. It's going to be both. Yeah. And then we have downtown beat. And yeah, then we you, have transit beat. Let me just say, we live in a world where like, say something may happen today where something big happens and we have to send a lot of people. We can't predict that. So. Yeah. I, I'm. I guess I'm wondering if the something big is transit, and we know that every day Coliseum or, or Belvedere or, or Southgate is, is like at, at what point does it justify a, almost a permanent position? So as we said, by the end of 24, we'll have 50 police officers allocated to transit. Yeah. I hear Car Councillor Cartmel's urgency about this, and yeah, I guess I'm wondering as well too. So I was looking at the data in the annual report, and we're still doing the the... 14 uh, school resource officers. So we're making the decision that the, that program is, is worth having people in. I guess it's, I'm, I'm wondering with limited officers, with people on leave, with overtime, with all these other demands, like. So we make those assessments all the time based on the value and the impact of those deployments. I could tell you our, transits, our transit officers actually came from our disruption team. So we collapse disruption teams which respond to protests and rallies and events to staff our transit teams. So we're always making on the fly shifts and adjustments as there are requirements of the service. I guess I read when, when like on page 14, when the school resource officers did 547 hours of coaching and engaging, like that's, and then I hear these stories about transit, like how do I communicate to my constituents that like every single dollar an hour we're spending is in the most critical mission critical? I think that's your answer there. You tell them that we try to make adjustments for their resources as needed and on the requirements. And, and we get a lot of requests, right? So we try to satisfy those as we deem necessary. Okay. I, one thing, like, like I think your officers are, are overworked, but sometimes I wonder if it's the right work. Like I note 30 to 50% of the calls are general service, aka like business vandalized the night before. Have we thought about ways that we could hire, if we have an officer shortage and we can't hire, could we hire like paralegals or something to go and do paperwork to free up officers to do crime? I, I think that'll be an excellent question for the annual report update, EPS's annual report update. Okay, finally which, then, which I is, guess. Which is today, Sure. How many, part of this council. How many other, how, are we at, how many shelter spaces are we at now, 24 seven for today? A memo was sent to your office uh, yesterday, I believe. Excellent. 
so do we know the number offhand? Or? Okay, I'll follow up. Thank you, out of time. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Principe. It is break time, yes. We'll be back at 3.45. So just to confirm, you have two other items, time specific at 3.45, so oh. we'll come back to this maybe tomorrow? Uh, no, hold on, hold on, Andre. The, we're, we have two people, there's maybe a few other questions. The delegation that you have for other two items that are in camera, 345, right? Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm just thinking how much time this will take. There's a couple of motions to be debated, it might take some time. I don't want to have police officers come back tomorrow again, right? They're needed. They're needed. Yeah, my no, there'll be different delegation, right? So yeah. my understanding for the um, the other delegation, it's not we don't have to do it at three forty five, but we have to do it today. Okay. Because there's yeah. You do I don't know how at much least time. One of them has to be done today. Okay, can we change that to that for, time to, to start at four o'clock? Four thirty. I'm not sure you're I'm not get sure we'll get through that, Mr. Minutes. Mayor, it, at, within half an hour. We should not do this on the fly. Yeah, and we shouldn't do this on the fly either, right? I understand that, right? So, uh, yeah, so if we, then you'd have to come back tomorrow. So, I, maybe, yeah, right? Let's, let's, I'm sorry, so sorry. This is how the process is, right? So, uh, we'll see how we go with the, so what we will do, we'll deal with the 330 time specific items when we come back, 345, sorry. And if we are done with those, we'll come back to this item. Okay, all right. Um, and if not done, then we'll come back tomorrow. Yeah, could we just go in private yeah, before just, you go? Yes, can recess? someone move it? We can private Thank you. subject to sections. Uh, uh, 24, 25. Thank you. Second. Uh, second. 24 and 25. Okay, uh, need a second. Second. Oh. All sex. Please vote. I second. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Just to check, Councillor Rutherford, have you come back? We'll mark Councillor Rutherford as absent. Councillor Stevenson and Councillor Jans. Councillor Jans, are you with us? Councillor Jans is absent. We have all the votes. Okay. Display the votes, please. That is carried.
We'll wait till uh, the doors are oh, opened. Yeah. We're back online. Okay. All right, we're back online. Everyone is here. Councillor Paquette. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I will move that uh, for 9.1 that the presentation be added as attachment one to the December 12, 2023 Employee and Legal Services Verbal Report ELS02203 that the Actions outlined in slide 14 of attachment one of the December 12, 2023 Employee and Legal Services Verbal Report of the same be approved and that the December 12, 2023 Employee and Legal Services Report of the same remain private pursuant to sections 24, 25 uh, of the Freedom of Information Pro Protection of Privacy Act. Second. Okay, please vote. Yes, Madam Clerk. Thanks, we have all the votes. That is carried. Want to do the next one too? Sure, and Mr. Mayor, for 9.3, I will move that the memorandum of agreement in attachment one of the December 12, 2023 Employee and Legal Services Report, ELS02231, between the City of Edmonton and Amalgamated Transit Union Local 569 DATS Unit, signed December 1st, 2023, be ratified that the December 12th, 2023 Employee and Legal Services Report of the same remain private pursuant to the sections 24 of the Freedom, oh, and 25 of the Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act. Okay, just need a second, second. Councillor Wright. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, let me see. We have 12 minutes. Do you think we could do 7-7? Seven, seven? I was thinking there's a 7-7. Seven, seven. Before we do 7-7, seven, no. seven, <laughs> No, before, but can we do 710? I think it's only voting purposes. Only Councillor Hamilton is exempted for voting sure, purposes. Sure, we can do 710. Or, see, I don't know how many questions other council members have that no. on that. I'm not getting any. No, so can someone bring forward 710, please? Oh, sure, I'll move to bring that forward. Yes. Second. Okay, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, this was at executive committee. So, I'll, I, uh, you know the vice chair, no? Yeah, I'll go to Councillor Salvador as vice chair to move it. Yeah, yeah. Um, happy to move that the amendments to policy C583, Guidelines for Development to the uh, 2009 Surplus School Sites, as outlined in Attachment 1 of the December 6, 2023 Community Services Report, CS01758, be approved. Second. Second by Councillor Wright. Okay, we have motion on the floor. Anyone to speak? Seeing none, please vote. Oops. This was that committee as well, right, so. Yes, I recall this, uh, sorry, I didn't sign up to speak. Okay, are you gonna speak on Sprint Um, Yeah, sorry, I go was just trying to yeah, go ahead. sign up to speak. Sorry, I was just, uh, yeah. had to check on something. Uh, I, I do have a question about it quickly, I think quickly. Um, I'm so sorry. I wasn't prepared for it to 
be coming ahead. So the it was for certain certain sites, correct? Or was it? Yeah, there was a list of sites. There provided. was a list of sites. So it was just for those sites specifically, this report, correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, that was just my question. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, now please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. I don't think we'll be able to deal with invitations to events in eight minutes. <laughs> I agree. Okay, I don't think there's I don't think there's any other item that we can deal in eight minutes, and I don't think it's worthwhile to start a conversation on other items that were before us. Is uh, it possible that we could just make sure we're all on the same page for what's going to happen tomorrow? That, you, that's you made some a good idea. Oh. So tell me. I was going to get you to tell me. Tell. Right, what I heard you say <laughs> is that when we come back tomorrow, so we're going to jump right into um, item 7.4, the 2022 Edmonton Police Service Annual Report. Yes. And then I heard you say that we would be going back, back to, to 7.1 seven seven and 7.2. Okay. Yeah. What you said was 7.3. Yeah, 7.3. But I, this is why I'm asking. Oh, yeah, we haven't. Oh, yes, because we, we haven't, haven't dealt. Yeah, of course we haven't dealt with that. Well, we haven't finished. Yeah, right. Seven, yeah, one, we two. haven't. So I think, so we'll start with the 7.4. Okay. Because we'll have police delegation at times specific as well. And maybe some folks from the delegation probably stay back for 7.3, yeah. right? So would you like to make, can we have a motion yeah. so that I can update the And then agenda? after that, we'll go back to 7.1 and 7.2. Okay. And then we're going to carry on and go to 7 7, which is Ortona yeah. Armory. Yeah. yeah. And then we're going to go to 7 12, invitations to events, or we could lay that over till January if we run out of time. Well, we'll see. Yep. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, then 9 2. Yep. Yeah. And then motions pending. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good. Can someone move that? I moved. Second. Thank you, Councillor Next, Second by Councillor. We'll just move in 7. Oh, you have a second. We need a seconder first. Councillor Paquette seconded. Okay, Councillor Tang, you have a question. Well, I guess I'm just wondering since uh, for like staffing purpose for 712, if we're not confident we're going to get to it, why don't we just lay it over for January just for that certainty? 712? Yeah. I, I might be with you till. Oh, oh it's, the it's end. you. Okay, never mind. Well, <laughs> never I mean, mind. I'm. I'm here. All right. Okay. I mean, we're going to ask. Yeah. Okay, withdrawn. Thanks. No, I'm happy if you want to lay this over till January now. We'll see how to go tomorrow. Oh, nice try, though. Yeah, we'll see how to go tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, Aileen is going to be here anyway, so. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, please. Please vote. So we're voting on. Just to make 7-3 your second item, yeah. time specific tomorrow. Okay. Please vote now. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, until then, we are on recess. And we are adjourned on